The story originates in a small forest area. Three masked men surrounded a man who was protecting his comrades. Suddenly, a young guy kicked one of them, after which the unknown man fell to the ground. The man with the katana asked who the boy was. The boy smiled and said that he was an ordinary eight-year-old boy passing by. They were discouraged. A hundred years before, there was a panic in the arena. The beastman shouted at Master Edelfus not to lose consciousness in any case. Another person told Dion to quickly apply healing magic while the girl was worried. The man smiled and told the others not to be so harsh. The beastman was asking why the blood wouldn't stop flowing. The man said that this happens with age. He asked if they had been able to defeat the disaster monster and if there were any other signs of its rebirth. They said that there was no such thing because the master had wiped out his entire presence with his magic. A young guy with glasses shouted that the master had not yet taught him this magic. The man with the weight laughed and said that it was just a simple improvisation. He said that since the guy had already seen it, he would also be able to use it on his own in the future. The guy shouted that the master should not dare to say such nonsense. The magician Milt was full of talent, determination and with a sincere heart, the master put all his magical knowledge into him. Even without his mentoring, he will be able to surpass the master as a magician. Zenobia's warrior. The little one who hated ghosts grew up and became a warrior that people can call the Holy Sword. Healer Dion. He has become such a good healer that he is even called the beloved child of the water god. The hero is Regina. She became strong enough to be called a hero, but she still cried constantly. The master said that they, his proud disciples, would now be on their own. She said that even without him, they would be fine. Dion exclaimed that this was not the case because they still needed their master. The man looked at them and thought that his students had grown up beautiful, and he was absolutely sure that they would continue to serve for the benefit of this world. He closed his eyes and thought that he was lucky because the place where he was dying was blessed by his beloved disciples. He was calm because he had a pretty good life. Suddenly he heard an unknown voice thanking Mr. Edelfus for his hard work. The man was a little confused. He began to turn around and ask who it was. He was desperately trying to find the source of that voice. The unknown man said that he was a beautiful and kind goddess. She said that, as a human, Edelphus was able to defeat the monster of disaster. She arrived there to celebrate his contribution to the development of mankind and welcome him as a new god. She asked if he still had any regrets. The man was a little discouraged that he would become a god. He had no children, but his students grew up to be great men and girls. He had nothing to regret, because it had been a wonderful 120 years of his life. However, he had a thought in his head. He said that he had just killed a disaster monster. Edelphus anxiously asked if he had succeeded in wiping him off the face of the earth. The goddess thought about it. After a few moments, she said that the monster of disaster is one of the apostles of God, so it is not so easy to destroy it. Edelphus exclaimed in amazement. He asked the goddess if this meant that everything he had been striving for all his life was in vain. The goddess continued and said that it was already amazing that he could do so much, being just a human. She added that, in addition, the monster of the disaster will temporarily fall asleep and will not disturb people. She suggested that he discuss the rest when he had already become a god. He didn't know what to say, because the disaster monster was alive. It was the enemy of humanity, but more than that, killing it was Edelfus' only goal, which he spent his entire life on. Until now, he couldn't believe that it had survived all this. He put his hand to his face and said it was extremely annoying. The man called out loudly to the goddess, even if she was the devil. He told her to listen to his wishes. The girl happily noted that he had finally accepted her as a goddess. A girl of pleasant appearance and with a gentle smile on her face asked if he had decided what kind of god he would become. Edelphus immediately exclaimed that he wanted to kill the monster of disaster, and only for this he was ready to become a god. The girl looked away and said that there were some restrictions. The man asked in disbelief what the restrictions were, after which he also asked her to explain everything in more detail. She said that the monster of disaster is a god, and to be precise, it is a former god who has become a fallen cursed beast, still possessing the power of a god, who retained his power befitting a fallen god. If the divine forces collide on earth, then the planet simply will not stand. That's why the gods couldn't directly interfere. They can only act through the inhabitants of the earth. Edelphus said that one of his students was just a favorite child of the water god. The girl agreed and said that he had caught the essence of her story. She added that all the students of Edelphus were the beloved children of the gods. Regina was the beloved child of the holy goddess, Milt was the favorite of the god of magic, and Zenobia was loved by the god of swords. Edelphus asked in amazement if his students were the favorites of the gods. The goddess proudly said that Edelphus himself is her favorite child. The man was a little shy and only agreed with her. 
The goddess cleared her throat a little and the next moment she approached and politely told him that it would be better if he were reborn not as a god, but as a human being. Right after that, she said that there were only three conditions. The man asked a little tensely what these conditions were. She explained that the first condition was that after reincarnation, he should not commit acts that would go against the gods. Edelphus immediately said that he would not do this. The second condition was that at the end of his second life he would definitely become a god. After that, the man realized that it was inevitable for him. The girl also told about the third condition which was rather not even a condition as such, but a manifestation of parental care. Hearing this, Edelphus was a little surprised. The goddess said that before reincarnation, he would have to train in heaven, because without this monster of disaster, he would definitely not win. Edelphus smiled and said that if he did get stronger, then let everything be as she said. The goddess opened the door slightly, from which an incredibly bright light was coming. She said that the passage of time in heaven and earth may differ, and in the time before reincarnation, he needs to reveal all his hidden abilities. Many silhouettes of various creatures could be seen in the doorway. From that moment on, all of Edelfuss's time was devoted to diligent training with the gods. It lasted for an insanely long time, after which he was finally reborn. In a large house there was a boy who is a descendant of a distant relative of Edelfuss. The boy was eight years old, and his name was Will Worms. He was diligently wiping the windows and thinking that the memory of his previous life had suddenly awakened last month, when he had just turned eight years old. Now he was God's acolyte, like an apostle. Earlier, the goddess had told him that as an apostle of the gods, it was important for him to behave with dignity. He thought she was really saying something like that. If he starts training from now on, then when the disaster monster is reborn, he will be in the prime of his powers. It will also play a role that in training with the gods, he greatly increased the limit of his hidden abilities. He was also trained in effective improvement techniques. He was thinking that now he was doing both cleaning and training. Suddenly someone kicked him hard and asked what he was doing there, after which he called the boy names. Two young men stood in front of him. One of them, the taller one, started swearing, asking why his father had taken in someone so useless. He was a child of the main line of the Worms Danan family. He said Will was insulting their name. Next to him was another boy from the main line of the family named Ivan. Will looked at them and thought that they belonged to the main line, but he had never had children. He apologized to them and said he would finish right away. He looked at Danan out of the corner of his eye and thought that these guys were descendants of his cousin. He suggested that, apparently, it was this line that became the main one after his death, and now they boast that they have become nobility. Noticing Will's gaze on himself, Danan got angry enough and, looking up at the boy, asked how dare he look at him like that. A grimace of intense malice appeared on his face, and he smiled cruelly. He hit Will again, causing the boy to fall to the floor with a loud thud. Danan screamed loudly, asking the boy if he still did not understand exactly what position he occupied in their house. Together with Ivan, they stood on opposite sides and started kicking Will and shouting for him to die. The boy, meanwhile, curled up and covered his head with his hands. At this time, the butler and the maid noticed it, who were terrified. The butler turned to Mr. Danan and politely, but at the same time rather nervously asked the guy to stop what he was doing. He anxiously said that Mr. Will would die if he continued to do this. Holding the boy by the hair, he lifted him up and with even more anger, which made his face contort, ordered them not to call the boy master, because he did not deserve that either. The butler was confused and apologized to Danan. He continued to beat the boy and swear at him. He wanted to kill Will. At the same time, Will was surprisingly calm. He thought about how, to be honest, Danan couldn't even give him a scratch. He thought it was time to end this concert because he didn't want to make Pryaluga even more nervous about this situation. Will decided that he would let Danan hit him now, and the guy would be quite satisfied with that. The moment Danan's fist almost touched Will's face, the boy quickly decided that he needed to put magical protection on his face. He did what he had planned quite quickly and deftly. After that, it was important for him to take the body in the other direction at the right moment. He did everything as planned. Danan's fist smashed into the magical protection after which Will seemed to fly to the side due to a strong blow. After a heavy crash from Will's fall to the floor, Danan grinned and asked Ivan if he had seen what had just happened. Ivan smiled, and then said that his brother was just great. Immediately after they had satisfied their self-esteem, they poured dirty water with loud laughter, in which Will washed a rag and told him to clean everything in that place. The boy raised his head a little and quietly agreed. As soon as the children from the main line of the family left, the butler and the maid immediately rushed to Will. The butler worriedly said that they could look at the boy's wounds right now. Will calmly told them not to worry because he was completely unharmed. 
The butler still looked at the boy's face with concern and said that this simply could not be. The next moment, he was surprised. Will was sitting on the floor with a sweet smile. The butler couldn't believe his eyes, because the boy had just been hit so hard. Will closed one eye and said that his father had trained him in combat techniques, and therefore he was not badly hurt. They breathed a sigh of relief and said that they understood, because this is what one would expect from the child whose parents were Mr. Kluge and Mrs. Maria. He said that they were both very good at martial arts. The butler told Will that he could leave the rest to them, because the gentleman would not be there anymore. Will wanted to object, but the maid said that it was simply impossible to force children to do hard work, because in the future it could greatly affect their health. By this time, a couple more servants had arrived and had already started to clean up the mess left by the children. The butler smilingly escorted Will to another room and respectfully told the gentleman to rest. There Will was met by Will's sweet little sister named Saria Borms. She was riding their pet Rune Rune. Will took the girl off the dog and asked with a smile if she was behaving well enough. Smiling broadly, the girl said she was good. After that, Will went up to Rune Rune and asked if he was a good boy. The dog obediently lowered its head so that Will could pet the beautiful creature. Will took Saria in his arms and smilingly thanked the servants for always looking out for his precious little sister. The old lady said he shouldn't thank her. She was only happy to look after the daughter of Mr. Kluja and Mrs. Maria. She said that Mr. Kluja was such an outstanding person. He was extremely talented in magic and very good as a leader. The girl sighed and said that it would be if only Mr. Kluja could be their master. The old lady shouted at the girl and told her to stop talking about it. She said that even the walls have ears, so the girl should refrain from such statements. The maid immediately apologized awkwardly for her words. Will held Saria in his arms and thought about how their kind and glorious parents had died two years ago. Earlier, he had heard rumors that his father and uncle had been arguing for a long time about who would be the head of the house. In the end, my uncle married a girl from an influential house and took a dominant position, and sent my father to a remote estate. My father died protecting the inhabitants of the territories under his control from magical monsters. They could no longer stay in that place, and they had to return with Saria to the manor. They were taken under their wing by the head of the Brahms house, in which they live to this day. However, in this house they were heavily burdened with hard work, and at the same time they could not even feed the children properly. Memories from his previous life had recently returned to Will, and he could, of course, escape from there. But he did not want to leave his younger sister there. He kept thinking about how his students would accept him now, because after his death, the four of them created the Council of Sages, which does everything to prevent the return of monsters to their world. Will also heard that they run a mission organization that has even more authority, and authority than the king and even the head of the church. A hundred years ago, all of his students were only about 20 years old, so it was not surprising that they were still alive today. The boy asked the butler if he knew how he could meet the founders of the Council of Sages. The guy said that it seemed to him that even the head of their house would find it very difficult to get an audience with them. However, if the boy enters a school for heroes and demonstrates outstanding academic results and becomes part of the mission organization, then he may succeed. Will asked what kind of hero school it was. The butler said that this school was organized by the Council of Sages. It was created with the aim of educating the next generation of heroes. The old lady said that the entrance exam, of course, is very difficult, but in the event that the gentleman enters, the school will take care of all the costs and he will be able to live with his sister in the dormitory. The boy was surprised. The old lady said that even if he could not enter the school of heroes, he could always try to take the exams to the school of sages or knights as well. Will thought about it seriously. According to the experience of a previous life, both the school of sages and the school of knights were available only to the elite, and now they are perceived as backup options. He was so deep in his thoughts that he didn't even notice that the interested servants were calling him. The butler asked admiringly if the boy would take the hero school exam. The maid exclaimed joyfully that he would definitely be able to go to the hero school, because she had not the slightest doubt. The boy was embarrassed and looked away, after which he said that he would pass or not, so far there could be no question about it. First of all, he decided that it was important for him to test his strength in this exam. He asked if there was any age limit for this exam. The guys replied that, as a rule, there is no such thing. Although all intelligent beings belong to humanoids, their life expectancy strongly depends on the race. There are a lot of graduates of the schools of sages and knights in the school of heroes, and that is why there may be very young students as well as older students. Will said that all he had to do was get permission from the head of the house. He assumed that Danan and Ivan would try to trick him again. The butler suggested that there would be no problem with that. 
he explained that admission only requires the consent of the applicant himself, even if he is a child. No one will go against the organization of the mission, which runs the school. In fact, there are a lot of children with a situation similar to Mr. Will's, which is why the organization protects them from guardians in this way. Will said that the organization has incredible credibility. The butler said that they would bring the boy the application forms so that the other gentlemen would not suspect anything. In fact, they had already started secretly preparing everything. We'll thank them, also noting that they looked very suspicious right now. Suddenly the boy realized that he had been there too long, and it was time for him to do something. He said he would leave Saria to them. He asked them to keep an eye on her, to which the servants enthusiastically agreed. Will patted his sister on the head and told her to behave herself. He also told Rune Rune to look after her sister. Will waved at them, then left. The girl with a smile on her face told him to come back as soon as possible. After a while, Will was walking along a street full of different people. He thought about how they hadn't been fed properly today either. The boy walked immersed in his thoughts about catching some kind of bird for dinner for Saria. After some time spent walking, he noticed that this alley was deserted, and there were castle walls just there. There was a good place at the end of the alley where there were no people, and it was close to the wall. He walked over and wondered if he could jump that high. Will concentrated in order to successfully focus the magic in his legs. Immediately after that, he pushed off the ground strongly, thanks to which he made a high enough jump to jump over the walls that separated the territory of the kingdom. Even the guard who was supposed to be guarding the walls couldn't notice such a clever trick. He was just snoring softly, holding a gun in his hands. Meanwhile, Will landed neatly. He did a little somersault, which made almost no sound. He ran forward at a fast pace, glad that everything turned out so well, because he didn't even have a single scratch on his body. He thought that he could finally see the result of those hard training sessions with the gods. He looked up, where he saw a bird that was calmly flying in some direction. Will picked up a small stone from the ground, then said out loud that he would concentrate the right amount of magic on his thumb. He looked at the bird again, carefully fixing the target he needed. Controlling the magic, he shot the stone directly at the bird. After covering a long distance, the stone hit the bird directly, after which the animal flew down. Will came over to pick up the bird, saying that it was a great skill practice. He smiled and already imagined how pleased Saria would be. He was well aware of how much his little sister loves poultry meat. This would be the third bird he would bring home for Saria. Suddenly the boy heard some sounds. He turned around and wondered if someone was fighting nearby. He was sure he had heard some kind of noise. There was indeed a battle going on at this time. A middle-aged man was fighting to protect his comrades. A young girl in a hat was treating a guy who was wearing a massive reservation. The man was holding out against four masked strangers. The man was holding a large katana in his hands. He talked about how he wasn't going to give up so easily. The man protecting his comrades looked at the girl out of the corner of his eye and seriously told her to leave it to him, and she ran away. In response, the girl said that if she did not treat them, they would all die. The man exclaimed that this was exactly what their enemies were trying to achieve. He looked at their comrades, who were lying on the ground and could not say anything from the pain and said that he did not specifically attack them so that they would stop. The girl who was sitting and trying her best to treat her companions said that even if they were, they would still be of absolutely no use if she did not cure them. Will, watching this, drew small conclusions. The boy noted that this man was far from a stupid person. But Will also noted that it seemed that the man would not be able to cope with these three enemies. From the information that Will could see, he assumed that these nine people were the fallen companions of the man. He wondered if the enemy would not strike, preventing them from escaping. The wounded told the girl not to worry and go. Suddenly, Will noticed that it wasn't that simple at all. Suddenly, one of the masked attackers pointed his dagger at a girl who was treating her comrades. Noticing this, she got scared and screamed. The girl didn't have the time or opportunity to dodge this attack. Suddenly, a man who had previously been in another place immediately rushed over and saved the girl. He deflected the enemy's blow with his sword. Suddenly, he felt something extremely sharp, which he could not have expected. As it turned out, one of the attackers attacked the man from behind, stabbing him with a dagger. The man involuntarily screamed in pain. He immediately turned around and took up the defense, realizing that he had made a mistake. Will noticed that the attacker attacked the man who was protecting the girl at the time. He thought that it was practically the same as attacking a single bear with a whole pack of wolves. The man protecting the girl said that the capital is very close and the girl should run to call for help. She hesitated and said she just couldn't escape from there. He turned around a little and told her that this would be the best option for all of them. He shouted at her to run from there and not look back. 
The girl silently turned around and ran away while small tears appeared in her eyes. When the girl was running away, one of the enemies decided to rush at her. He ran towards her, trying to stop the healer, but the man quickly found himself in the right place and stopped the enemy's attack. He shouted to the girl that she could entrust it to him. The worried girl turned to see what had happened, and to her horror she saw something that could be extremely dangerous for a man. She screamed loudly, trying to warn the man of the danger, but he no longer had enough time to dodge this attack. At the very last moment, Will got out of the bushes and attacked the enemy. He kicked him in the face, thanks to which he was able to send the stranger flying and save the man. The man himself, just like the girl, stopped, looking in shock at the boy who saved their lives. Will said that, of course, he did not know the essence of everything that was happening, but he would like to help them. The man asked in surprise who Will was. With a small smile on his face, the boy turned around and said that he was just an eight-year-old child who was passing by at a good moment. He immediately turned away and told the girl that she should focus on the treatment. The girl hesitated, trying to object for safety reasons. With a smile on his face, Will turned around and said that she should not worry, because the enemies would definitely not interfere with them. It was at this moment that one of the attackers tried to hit the boy from behind while he was distracted by the conversation. Despite such a sneaky attack, Will calmly grabbed the enemy's arm, which greatly surprised the masked man. He quickly and deftly managed to turn the enemy on his back and hit the ground. The last attacker could only watch in silence as his two masked comrades were thrown into one pile, because they were no longer able to fight. However, he was greatly amazed by what he saw when he looked in that direction again. With a quick jerk, Will reached the enemy and hit him in the face with his knee. The blow was so strong that the masked man lost his balance and flew to the side. Thanks to this attack, Will was able to send the enemy to sleep, as well as break the stranger's mask. He definitely won this fight. Immediately after his stunt, the boy was surprised by what he heard. Someone was cursing loudly behind him, calling the other a fool. He just silently looked in that direction. The man who deftly finished off the enemies with his sword had already sheathed his weapon, because all the enemies were dead and lying on the ground. The man sat down on the floor and began carefully tying up the enemies. He said that Will had helped him out, after which he politely thanked the boy for his help. Will just said he was glad he could help them. He put his hands on his hips and turned to take stock. He saw how the girl was putting all her strength into the treatment of her comrades. He approached her and said that it seemed that she herself really needed treatment now. The worried and tired girl immediately exclaimed that this was not the case. She looked at one of her comrades who was coughing up blood heavily and said that she had to cure them as soon as possible. Will looked at it and sighed thoughtfully. Immediately after, he slightly closed his left eye and raised his hands. He told the girl to give him the job. Will raised his hands high and chanted a spell in an unknown language. He was focused, and his eyes were closed so as not to disturb him. In the next moment, a fairly large magic circle appeared around them, which with its area could gather all the wounded lying unconscious or exhausted on the ground. Will's magic power began to rise up. The man and the girl stared in amazement at the magical power developing around them. They were unable to say anything. Will quickly opened his eyes, then waved his hand in front of him. He pointed his hands forward, after which the man was amazed to notice how all his wounds began to rise up and disappear. The girl also noticed this. She stared at her hands in amazement, unable to believe that she was cured. The girl saw how everyone who got into the territory of magic was treated, and all their wounds rose into the air along with Will's magical power. The man who had been silent earlier said quietly that it was some kind of miracle. His voice was trembling with surprise. The girl asked in amazement if he had cured everyone. She genuinely didn't understand how he was able to heal them all without even touching anyone. Will was looking at everyone around him. He remembered about his student. Once upon a time, he told him that if he practiced more, he would succeed. To this, the student nervously replied that he could not treat people without touching them. Will looked into it and smiled. He said that he knew how to do it from the very beginning. Suddenly he came to his senses and turned to the girl. He awkwardly scratched his face and looked away, after which he said that there was nothing unusual in this, and she should forget about his words. She just stared at him in silence, in shock. With a big smile on his face, the man said that Will had helped them all, and he was their savior. He came a little closer, opening his arms. The man with a smile asked Will to let him thank the boy. Will still awkwardly turned around and thanked the man, after which he said that he shouldn't thank him. He smiled sweetly and turned around, about to leave. He said they didn't have to do it at all. After that, he waved to them and wished them a safe journey. Immediately after that, he ran on his way. Still amazed by what had happened, the guys shouted after Will to at least tell him his name. Without even turning back, Will waved at them again, 
after which he said that he was not worthy of it at all. After that, he ran off into the forest on his way. The startled man and the healer stared in the direction Will had gone for some time. They were amazed at how incredible he turned out to be. At this time, Will was running through the forest, holding in one hand a small bird that he had caught for his little sister. As he ran, he distinctly felt some movement in the bushes behind him. He quickly realized that someone was following him and tensed up. Initially, Will thought that this stranger would leave him fine, but it never happened, although he walked a decent distance. The boy stopped and turned back. He asked the unknown stalker to show himself. Someone watching the boy from the bushes remained silent. After he realized that he had been discovered, the unknown man quickly got out into a more open area to look at Will, as well as show himself. The boy was very surprised when he saw a small clot of mucus in front of him, who smiled benevolently at him. There was silence for a while. The next moment, Will asked in surprise if it was really slime. He was surprised enough, but there was not a drop of fear on him. Will stared in amazement at a small clot of mucus that was joyfully jumping right in front of him, without expressing any aggression. A little awkwardly, Will looked at the clot and thought that this creature was looking at him as if it was saying that it wanted to go with the boy. Will looked at the rather joyful slime and decided to ask if the creature wanted to go with him. Upon hearing this, the slime was overjoyed and happily shook her head, indicating that this was exactly what she wanted. Will turned to her a little and sighed, then said that everything was fine. He opened his vest a little and told the slime to hide in his clothes so that no one would see it. The creature did exactly as he asked. At a fairly fast pace, the slime reached Will, after which, in the blink of an eye, it was behind the boy's clothes. Will covered his vest with his hand for a moment and thought that it looked quite strange. He took a deep breath, then set off again. As he quickly crossed any obstacles, he thought about the fact that there are several heroes in the city who walk with monsters, so everything should be fine. However, considering that he is an eight-year-old child, it already looks worse. After some time spent on the road, Will reached the stable, which was located on the territory of the Worms family. He noted that he had already returned. The boy came in and stroked the horses, then asked if they were behaving well. He was the only one who lived in the stable. When he got used to it, it wasn't so bad, especially since he has nice neighbors in the face of horses. While he was stroking the horses, he suddenly heard a dog barking not far from him. The boy immediately looked with interest in the direction from which the sound was coming. He guessed who it might be. Little Saria rode on a rune run to her brother. She waved happily at him as the old lady who looks after them walked behind them with a slight smile on her face. Will was delighted to see them. When the girl got close enough, Will picked her up in his arms and asked what happened. He asked if she shouldn't be relaxing with their grandmother in another room right now. He looked serious as he asked this. The old lady sighed and smiled, then apologized to Will and said that Saria just wanted to be with him today. Will looked at the girl and asked if it was true. Saria looked guilty. She looked down at the floor and awkwardly asked if she couldn't be with her brother. There was a slight blush on her face and her eyes were shining. Will scratched his face in mild surprise. He looked at the girl and said that she could spend time with him. However, there were some problems associated with this. The old lady handed Will a small basket with sandwiches in it. The boy awkwardly apologized to his grandmother for disturbing her. She smiled and said that everything was fine, because she thought that Saria missed her brother a lot. She said she would pick up the girl tomorrow. With a sad look, Saria walked forward, no matter what. Will said that, in any case, he would hardly be in this place at this time next time. While the boys were walking through the stable, Will asked the girl what had happened. Offended, Saria did not want to answer him, so she just walked forward in silence. This awkwardness was interrupted by Roon Roon, who barked loudly, trying to get closer to Will. The dog sniffed the boy's vest carefully while Will asked in disbelief what was wrong. The dog was trying to get to his own. The next moment, the boy's vest began to rustle, after which, in the blink of an eye, mucus came out of it. She jumped out of there so fast that Will lost his balance a little and spun around. The boy looked at how the dog was playing with the slime and said a little irritably that he had to hide the slime. He asked the dog not to touch the creature, but she did not listen to him at all. Saria stared at the slime in amazement, not knowing what to say. Noticing the girl and her gaze, the creature was very confused, not knowing what to do next. Saria was delighted with this find. The extremely joyful girl exclaimed that this creature reminded her of jelly. She picked up the slime in her arms and hugged it a little. The creature was nervous, but Saria was only talking about how cute this slime was. Looking at this, Will calmly sighed and smiled. Will explained that this creature is a slime, after which he noted that the girl should not tell anyone that she saw him here. 
She hugged the slime closer to her and agreed, after which she said that she would keep a secret about this jelly. She looked very happy. After a while, the boy took a bird that he caught himself, as well as a basket that the old woman gave them. He offered the girl something to eat, to which she readily agreed. Will took a small stove and a frying pan, on which he quickly cooked a dish. Saria smiled and thanked her brother for the treats. The boy also thanked his sister for her help. The guys changed into sleeping clothes. Will said that there was a blanket there, and if Saria got cold, she should tell her about it. The girl agreed. She hugged Rune Rune and said that he was very warm. The dog barked softly, confirming the girl's words. Suddenly, Will noticed that his sister was upset and asked if something had happened to her. He assumed that her father had scolded her. He asked if she was behaving well. The girl began to crumple the blanket in her hands. She hugged him a little and said with emotion that her brother was taking her to study at the academy. Will told his sister that she shouldn't worry about it, because when he entered the academy, Saria and Rune Rune would also be with him. The girl looked at him and asked if it was true. Will hugged them tightly and said he was wondering if Saria would do well at the academy. The girl smiled and said it was obvious. After a while, the girl said that it was time to return to her grandmother. Will laughed and noted that Saria is a very good girl, because she listens to her elders. Three days later, work in the mansion was in full swing. Will was silently cleaning the toilet. Suddenly, he thought that from the moment the memory of his past life returned to him, he began to train even while cleaning toilets. The magical force in the body circulates at the same time as it applies a magical charge that is opposite to the movement of the body. He thought he needed to combine it. This exercise helped to strengthen muscles and magic power. He did it with his bare hands on the orders of the captain for additional training. To do this, he needs to cover his hands with a thin magic film so as not to touch the dirt, this is an excellent exercise. He had 100% protection from dirt. Suddenly, during the exercise, the boy heard loud noises. He turned back and noted that it had become too noisy somehow. As it turned out, at this time Danan was talking about how this act was too selfish. Ivan supported his brother and said that even though they were saving this worthless child, they were still members of the Worms family. The girl with long hair calmly told them to go to the head of the family with all their complaints. Danan and Ivan continued to follow the girl. They told her that they were watching the house while the head of the family was away. She completely ignored them. She asked the maid where Will Worms was. The maid said she called him to the second floor. The girl apologized and said that she had not asked permission from either them or the head of the family. The girl immediately rushed to the toilet where Will was. She opened the door and saw a boy who was cleaning the toilet. She asked if he was Will Worms. The boy slowly got up from the floor and confirmed this, after which he asked what happened. The girl bowed and said that she was part of the rescue team. She explained that the entrance exam to the Academy of Heroes will take place tomorrow. Danan burst into the room and asked Will what was going on here. He viciously asked why the boy had applied, without even telling him anything about it. Will assumed that his application had been successfully delivered to the Academy. The girl was patient. Will asked her if she had come to him just to tell him that there would be an exam tomorrow. She looked at the brothers and said that she usually doesn't do this, but she clearly expected something was wrong, so she came. She picked up Will and said they should go as soon as possible. Without thinking twice, the boy agreed and went straight after her. Startled, Danan and Ivan looked at them. Danan shouted loudly, ordering Will not to ignore him. He immediately attacked them, asking if Will was mocking them. He stated that he would not let it go so easily. He was about to hit the boy, but the girl deftly turned around. She only touched his fist with one finger, but it caused a violent reaction. Lightning bolts appeared in the air. Danan was genuinely amazed. Will was no less surprised watching what was happening in front of his eyes. He noted that this girl has really wonderful magic. He was amazed that she stopped her fist with just one finger. The girl looked at him sternly and threatened that if he continued to behave like this, she might regard it as a betrayal. Danan was seriously scared. Combined with the pain of the girl's actions and the fear of her threat, tears appeared in his eyes, and liquid flowed from his nose. He screamed in fear. After the girl left the brothers, Will calmly asked her if he could take his sister to the academy with him. The girl quickly confirmed this and said that his relatives and pets could stay in their dormitory for the duration of the exams. She also noted that there may be slime left in the dorm, too. At that very moment, both Will and the small clot of mucus that was hiding in his vest were genuinely amazed by what she said. At that moment, one of the maids immediately told Will that she was quickly going to get Saria. Will agreed and thanked her politely. The other servants were jubilant, because they were able to help the boy escape. 
Suddenly, Danan, who was still sitting on the floor from shock, told the girl that he was going to take this exam too. She looked down at him in silence. The girl looked at him and smiled, after which she said that he should not be shy about doing what he wanted. There was something unusual about her smile. She carefully lowered her hands, after which she made a not too strong bow, and told him that their Academy of Heroes would always be ready to accept applications from absolutely everyone. She was smiling peacefully as she said this. After a while, the guys were already on their way to the academy. Saria pressed herself against the window and admired every street, while loudly expressing her admiration for all the views of this city. Noticing what the girl was doing, Will told her that she shouldn't lean against the glass so much. The girl immediately froze upon hearing these words. Suddenly, the girl who was riding with them turned to Will and fell silent. The boy turned in her direction to find out why she had called him. He immediately saw how Rune Rune was clinging to the girl, which embarrassed her quite a lot. Will told their pet to stop doing this, because the girl was already blushing with embarrassment. The dog silently sniffed the girl, getting to know her. The girl looked down and said a little awkwardly that he shouldn't stop the dog, because everything is fine. The dog sighed loudly, showing his displeasure. The girl covered the lower part of her face with her scarf a little, then looked away and awkwardly asked if she could stroke Rune Rune a little. She was visibly nervous when she asked for permission to do this. Upon hearing this sweet request, Will smiled broadly and quickly agreed. The boy was very friendly and kind to the girl. She immediately hugged the dog and noted how big it was. Will kindly explained that Rune Rune was a simple puppy who wandered into their garden on his birthday. Will smiled and said that at the moment this wonderful dog is already 20 years old, and he is still growing. Upon hearing this, the girl asked in amazement if he was really still growing. After that, the extremely interested girl's gaze fell on a little girl who was sitting and admiring her. She asked Saria Worms, a little awkwardly, what had happened. The girl called the girl her sister and asked her what her name was. Immediately after that, she introduced herself, giving her name, Saria. The girl coughed softly, then apologized and said that she had forgotten to introduce herself. She closed her eyes, then smiled sweetly, and a blush appeared on her face. She said her name was Artie. The mysterious girl's full name was Artie Zenon Barling. After she introduced herself, she put her hand on Saria's head and stroked the cute girl. Saria was just incredibly excited. Her eyes were shining as she looked at Artie. She screamed loudly that her sister had very beautiful hair. She also noted that her eyes are also just wonderful. The sudden compliments definitely took the girl by surprise. She blushed deeply, not knowing at all what to say to that. Saria put her hands on the girl's knees and smiled sweetly at her while Artie, red as a tomato, thanked her and stroked her head. At the same time, the girl was combing the fur of Rune Rune, who was no less pleased than Saria. Will watched the scene with a satisfied face. After that, he asked the girl how she knew that the captains were going to interfere with his exam. This question brought Artie to his senses. She explained that the person who brought them the application had previously asked them to take care of it. Will immediately realized that it was the maid and the butler who had asked for it, who had taken such good care of him. He thought hard, because now he would worry about them and their well-being. As if reading the boy's mind, Artie told him that he shouldn't worry about it. She proudly explained that the academy would not tell who brought the application, and they would ask them not to punish subordinates for it. Will smiled awkwardly and said it was a little reassuring. Saria, who was still carefully watching the scene outside the window change, called Will to look at what a big building was very close by. Noticing this building, Artie noted that they seemed to have already arrived. It was the Academy of Heroes, a large building that was guarded by several people. There were high walls around it, which ended at the large entrance to the Academy. As soon as the coachman opened the carriage door, Saria and Run Run instantly ran out of it to look at the surrounding area. The girl excitedly shouted about how big this building is, even, one might say, huge. Will reached out to the girl, trying to tell her not to run like that, because she might fall. Saria wasn't listening to her brother at all and was looking at everything around her. Artie told the guys that she would take them to their room. After a while, the girl brought the guys to the hostel. Will, along with Saria and Rune Rune, stayed in the 401st dorm room. Artie politely opened the door for them and pointed, noting that this was their room. She explained that if he could pass the exam, then they could stay in this place to live for the rest of their lives. Artie handed Will his keys right into his hands. After that, she said that later she could show them the children's room. She explained that he would be able to take Saria there. Will silently took the keys. After that, he asked in surprise if there was even such a thing. Artie said that this is obviously the case, because they have a fairly large number of students with children. Saria was already happily jumping on the bed at this time. 
The girl explained that in that place, children also receive education, which is necessary for their age. Some of them are even younger than Syria, and some are older than Will Worms himself. The boy noted that this was quite strange, which Artie just couldn't disagree with. She said that the Hero Academy is the place where the most talented creatures from all over the world study. She said that they had provided the students with the most comfortable living and learning conditions. They had everything, a canteen, a training center and a dormitory. Will thought that now he understood the reason why they had built the academy outside the capital. This was quite different from how they were treated in the worm's house. The boy led Saria by the hand with Artie and thought that he really should pass the exam at any cost, and all for the sake of his beloved Saria. After some time spent on the way from the hostel, the guys came to a small nursery. The sweet teacher took Saria and Rune Rune away. The girl turned and waved at Will, also wishing him luck. The boy noted that he did not expect at all that they took care of the services. Artie calmly explained that this was also part of their job. She also said that she had already been informed that Will Worms knows almost nothing about both the academy itself and the entrance exams. The boy froze and sighed a little softly. In his previous life, there wasn't even an academy for heroes, and his family had to work day and night, so they didn't have much contact with the world. As for his current knowledge, he had much less than an eight-year-old child. As they walked down the hallway, Artie asked if Will had checked the favorability level of the guardian deity. Will looked at Artie in some surprise and asked what it was. The girl patiently explained that this is a technique that was developed by a great sage who is a member of the Council of Sages. Will continued to ask. He asked what the great sage was like. Artie said that he was a disciple of the sage Adolphus Worms. She was talking about Milt Edelweiss. Upon hearing this, Will was a little surprised and proud that Milt had already received a surname, and also developed a new technique without his help. He blushed a little and thought it was a great honor. He asked again why it was the big one. He asked why, for example, it couldn't be a great sage. The girl stopped and said that he was right. After that, she said that the sage was Adolphus Worms. Will froze briefly in shock at the information he received. He asked what kind of guardian deities they were. The girl said that every representative of the human race has a guardian deity. The guardian deity is a human deity who leads an entire race. Sometimes not only humans, but also other beings receive the protection of deities. She said that the most famous of them is a member of the procurement board. He was Dion, who was the favorite of the god of water. Will wondered if Dion had the same last name as Milt. He assumed that it was taken from his past life. He turned away and thought about how embarrassing it was. Artie said that those favored by the deities are endowed with the abilities corresponding to their patrons, and those who are most favored are the favorites of the gods. Therefore, a person whose deity is just a human god is simple. This short conversation allowed the guys to spend time, so they got to their destination quickly enough. Artie opened a large door with a magic circle on it and told Will to go inside. They entered a room that was completely covered with magical protection. There was a small book in the center of the room, and next to it was a pillar with a ball in it. She explained that it was a device that would help him measure his favorability. The girl led him in and told him to put his hand on a large crystal nearby. After that, she said that now it was possible to measure his favor. The boy put his hand up and began to look closely at the magic ball. He thought about being an apostle who had been trained by many different gods. He was sure that many of them would be his guardians. Suddenly, the image of the goddess with whom he had recently talked appeared before his eyes. The girl said that the measurement was over and Will silently shuddered. In some shock, he continued to remain silent, which caused Artie to ask if something had happened. The boy said that everything was fine and then asked what the results were. The girl looked at the magic book and said that the patron saint of Will Worms, apparently, is a simple human deity. Hearing this, Will was greatly surprised. Will sighed a little disappointed. After that, he looked back at the book that Artie was still holding and asked if it turned out that God was his only guardian. In response, the girl said that, unfortunately, everything is correct. After hearing this, Will was silent for a while. All this time, he just stared ahead without saying a word. The boy continued. He asked if there were any cases of loss of consciousness when using this measuring device. He looked a little awkward while asking about it. The girl was confused, and then said that according to the information that she already knows, there have been no such cases before. Will stared ahead in silence. He thought about how he had previously practiced with the gods for quite a long time before being reborn in this place. He was sure that they liked him. He stared ahead in frustration, thinking that all these gods had always been so friendly with him, and now there was no one. Suddenly he saw a glow. Ten seconds later, Artie noticed something unusual, which is why she told Will to put his hand on this crystal again. 
The boy stared at him intently, then slowly put his hand to the crystal, on which small inscriptions glittered. He closed his eyes, sinking into his consciousness, as well as giving himself completely to this crystal, and the opportunity to discover its patron. After a couple of moments, the boy opened his eyes again, but the location around him changed. He saw a large room in which he had once talked with a goddess he had never seen before. He looked around in surprise, examining this room. Will looked up and asked aloud if this was the world of the gods. There was some puzzlement on his face. Suddenly, the boy heard someone behind him asking what Will had seen there. The boy was a little surprised to hear a familiar voice. Behind him stood an extremely agitated, but already well-known goddess. She looked at him, then asked if the one she was seeing in front of her right now was Edel. The boy closed his eyes and put his hands on his sides, after which he said that his name was Will now. The goddess recognized him and came closer, after which she told him that he looked very good now. Immediately after, crowds of other gods began to appear behind the goddess. The girl was obviously unhappy with this. They shouted joyfully, asking if their Edelfus had arrived. When they noticed the boy, they were even more pleased. They asked if this meant that the boy had already died. Will calmly told them that this was not entirely true, because he had died, and now he was named Will. The gods answered him loudly, rejoicing in the dialogue. The goddess stepped aside, but her face was displeased. She began to push them in different directions with all her might. She came closer to him and asked what had happened since he was there. Will asked, a little surprised, if they hadn't been watching his actions. The gods began to shout to him that they had seen everything perfectly. One by one they joined in, noting that they were all watching how Will lived. The boy smiled sweetly as he listened to them. The further the gods went, the more annoyed the girl who had been with Will from the very beginning of his journey became. She looked quickly and displeased at the other gods and said that it made her a little mad. The goddess quickly waved her hand, thanks to which she successfully cast a spell on all the gods who were in the room. It was a spell forbidding them to speak. Immediately after that, there was silence in the room. The girl closed her eyes, ignoring the displeasure of the gods, and then asked how Will was able to get to this place. The boy thought about it and looked at the floor, trying to remember what had happened earlier. After a short story to the goddess, the girl asked in surprise how he was able to do this. Will didn't know the answer to that question. He noted that for the gods, humans are like the smallest ants. Even if he starts feeding them on a whim, this does not mean at all that they are interested in the person. He led to the fact that sometimes God is not interested in human life, even if his most beloved child is there and lives there. Noticing that Will was distracted quite ostentatiously, she exclaimed loudly, asking if he was really thinking about something else again. Will looked away and started humming something of his own. The girl began to swing her legs. She asked Will if he really liked living alone. She said that sometimes she even wonders how different this dimension was from the world Will lived in. She sighed and smiled, and then said that everything was as Will had said, because these two worlds were completely different in structure. After that, she decided to change the subject and said that they should return to her first question. With a big smile, she asked how the boy was doing. Will said that everything was going smoothly and as usual. The boy wondered what could have happened to him if he had died before his memory returned to him. The girl hesitated when she heard this question, after which she laughed awkwardly. Suddenly, someone else intervened in their conversation and said that this would simply never have happened. Noticing the new interlocutor, Will was a little surprised. Yugami appeared before him, an unknown person who had the form of a beastman. He told the boy that no one would have found out about it, because Luxanis always looked after Will. Upon hearing this, Will asked in amazement if he had heard Laogonis' name correctly. He stared intently at Inugami. The man smiled broadly, so much so that his eyes closed. He told Will that Rune Rune is the divine child of Luxanis. Upon hearing this, Will asked in amazement if Rune Rune was not an ordinary dog. He said that he, a deity named Luxanis, sent his child to Earth when Will was born. The goddess jumped forward and pointed at herself, saying that he did it at her request. Will noted with some surprise what he had heard. The Yugami said that Rune Run has no memories of this world, because he was sent to Earth when he was a puppy, but he has the same magical power, called Divine, as he does. The purpose of Rune Run has always been to help as well as protect Will. The boy said that Rune Run looked more like his friend than a guard. He is very smart, kind, and also takes great care of his sister. Inugami smiled proudly and closed his eyes. He said it was true. He patted the boy on the head and said that the way Rune Run gets along with Will, he is also very happy to meet this boy. Immediately after that, Inugami asked if Will remembered what he had called Luxani's Run Run Om. Upon hearing this, the boy asked in amazement if this was really the case. Inugami said that when they first met the boy, he immediately gave that name. 
Hearing this, Wool was quite surprised. Suddenly, another goddess appeared behind him, who said that she also sent her child to him on earth. Will immediately turned to the source of the voice. The goddess of slime appeared before him. She said that he really looks incredibly cute. When he heard her, he asked in surprise if she was a slime. She said that's exactly what it was. The goddess said that Will's sister gave her a great name, which cannot be said about his ability to choose names. The boy blushed and then thanked the goddess for the compliment. Together with Inugami, she thought that Will was incredibly stupid. Suddenly the boy came to his senses. He asked if it turns out that the children of these gods who live on earth also have divine powers. Inugami said that it wasn't quite like that. There are children and demigods. Each deity, like Inugami, has children who are mere mortals, and in the case of Luxanis, they are ordinary dogs. But there are also demigods who are under the protection of guardians and possess magic. The children of the guardian gods could include Arty, and the demigods were Rune Rune and the slime that followed Will, Fury Fury. The goddess lost her patience and asked if they had finished talking, because, by the way, she also had questions. And Yugami exclaimed, saying that he hadn't finished yet, and she should wait some more. The goddess tearfully said that she had to find out about Will's life. Suddenly she noticed that it had become transparent. The boy assumed that, apparently, his time had already run out. Finally, the gods decided to say goodbye. And Yugami told Will to remember that Luxanis was looking out for him. The slime said that Fury Fury will always be there, since this child and she are inextricably linked. Will thank them for their concern. The goddess sternly said that she didn't have much time, so he should listen to her. She called him anxiously and said that it was important because it was about the boy's human life. She tried to say that it was also about the deity who was looking after him, but at the most inopportune moment their time ended and the connection was cut off. Will stared into the void and tried to figure out what this goddess was talking about, because he still didn't understand anything. She was very hard to hear, so he never heard anything important. He stared into space while Artie watched him. She called him, after which she said that the number of guardian deities was not taken into account in the entrance exam results. It was true that it was true that no one had passed the test by relying on a deity. To change your divine powers in advance, you need to turn to the post-admission learning policy. Initially, test competitions are pre-arranged for the examinees. In order to study your specialty and take measures to pass the exam, you need to check the check in the temple. Will stared at her in amazement. Artie looked at him and asked if he understood her. Will stared at her in silence. He sighed and thanked her, after which he said that he would do everything in his power to pass the exam. The girl said it was good. Will asked what the content of the entrance exams was. He was wondering if he could find out about it in advance. The girl said that the exam will be divided into written and practical. She said that there are several types of practical exams. If he scores high, he can be sure that he passed it. People who have received blessings from the deities are considered lucky and lucky. Will asked if Artie had a guardian deity. The girl said that her guardian god is the god of the sword. Will immediately remembered this deity. He noticed that she was very young and already a member of the rescue squad. The girl turned white and said that although she was there, in fact her position was an assistant, and she had recently passed the test to be in the squad. Will asked if it was possible. Artie confirmed this, saying that hard training and desire can do anything. At this time, many gods were watching them. The gods wondered if Will didn't trust them. The other gods agreed and told him to explain himself to them. At this time, the goddess silently covered her ears, not wanting to listen. She asked what she could do. She did not think that he would return so quickly that she would not have time to tell him anything. She told them to stop talking nonsense. One of the gods told her to calm down. The flame god told the genie that, nevertheless, there is a problem with the device that created the child of the god of lies, and that is why Will treats them with caution. The genie asked why they decided that, because it wasn't that bad. The human race does not know about the existence of the apostles, and therefore they are powerless there. He wondered why their strength could not be measured by this device. He also asked who the apostles were. The flame god asked the interlocutor if he was really a god. He said that it was only recently that the goddess of slime explained everything clearly and made it clear the difference between children and deities. Suddenly he asked if the flame god was talking about children and demigods. He wondered what the connection was. The flame god asked if the genie had forgotten. He said that Will, who was reborn after a deal with God, is an unusual child. It turned out that he has the stigma of a divine eclipse, and he is the same as Rune Rune and Fury Fury. In addition, he is the child of the Supreme God and the Guardian Princess, and the Apostle is a demigod with magical abilities. Will, who had received their blessing, was now a messenger from God. 
In general, the apostles are demigod beasts, and Will is one of the apostles, as he has the same magic as the demigod guardians. He asked why Will was being treated like an incompetent child. The flame god said that he had messed up everything again. They were talking about a device designed for mortals, and that she simply couldn't measure the power of God. The god of lies thought about it, and then said that he understood everything. The flame god realized that his interlocutor was lying. He said he didn't think Will would have any problems. He said Will was his student, after all. The flame god noted that the flame god was right. The others also joined in, saying that Will and their student did too. The goddess exclaimed for Will to be sent his one demigod beast. The second deity said that he had already started working on it. The gods thought that the guardians were just trouble. At that time, Saria was playing with a doll in kindergarten. Suddenly Will came into the room, and the girl was immediately delighted. She went to him, but the boy, who was running past, hit the girl with all his might. She hit the bedside table, which caused the jug that was standing on it to wobble. He was about to fall on the girl who was crying in pain. Artie wanted to warn the girl, but in the blink of an eye, Will swept past her, creating a strong current of wind. In just an instant, Will successfully took his little sister and saved her from danger. The vase fell and broke, but Saria was no longer in that place. Will reached an incredible speed, thanks to which he was able to save the girl. He ended up at the other end of the room, where he set Saria on her feet. Artie was amazed that he had covered such a distance, and in just an instant he had caught the girl. She didn't even see him move from his seat. At this time, Will hugged his sister, breathing heavily. Saria, on the other hand, looked at her brother as a hero. The teacher strongly scolded the boy who hit Saria. He was crying at the time. Saria apologized for bothering her, but Artie said that everything was fine and she shouldn't worry about anything. Artie stood silently in front of the large door. She held onto her weapon, holding onto the tension. Suddenly, the door swung open in front of her. The man who was inside invited the girl to go inside. Artie was a little confused, because she was about to open the door. She came in and informed the girl inside that she had just returned from a mission. The girl agreed, and then asked how it went. It was Zenobia Edelbaring, a member of the Council of Swordsmen, and also a part-time student of Edelfuss. She asked if Will had had time to prove himself. Artie said that his behavior was not at all like an eight-year-old child. She noted that he was wise enough for his age, and his strength was extremely great. Zenobia got up from her chair and noted what she had heard. She started walking around her desk, lost in her thoughts. She kept thinking that it was interesting enough for her. Suddenly Artie said that the divine guardian of Will Worms is a human god. Upon hearing this, Zenobia stopped in her tracks in amazement. She froze. Zenobia stood for a while, then looked at Artie and asked if it was true. The girl immediately confirmed her words. Zenobia thought deeply again. She did not understand at all why this was so, and she was very interested in it. Artie asked what the girl was talking about. Zenobia closed one eye and said that everything was fine, and there was nothing wrong with it. She asked again if there was anything else. After these words, Artie was already thinking. She did not understand at all what this phrase could mean. She tilted her head and wondered what Zenobia might be up to, because she wasn't going to say anything. Seeing such a reaction, the elf became nervous. Zenobia put her hands on Artie's shoulders and took a deep breath, then asked the girl to listen to her. She seriously said that she did not want to interrogate her at all, but it was important for her to know if Artie had noticed any changes in this boy. She talked about his behavior, and also about whether it could be that he was behaving unnaturally. Artie looked away and remembered that Will had asked her earlier if there had been any previous cases of loss of consciousness when using a measuring device. Zenobia was a little surprised to hear that. She started pacing around her desk again, wondering what he might have meant. Zenobia thought that she urgently needed to consult with Milt. Artie watched in silence. Artie said that if his guardian deity is just a god, then he hardly has any abilities or magic. Zenobia took a deep breath, then asked what Artie herself thought about it. The girl remembered how the boy had saved his sister, after which she confidently said that Will had an innate talent. Zenobia smiled at this reaction. She took out one of her wooden swords and said that if that was the case, then Artie should keep an eye on Will. Artie said she understood. Zenobia began to swing her sword, actively practicing. Artie watched this in silence for a while. Zenobia's punches grew stronger, causing the air currents from the punches to hit Artie's face. The girl remained calm to the last and stood still. 
Without stopping to swing her sword, Zenobia asked if there was anything else Artie would like to ask. She immediately asked why Zenobia had told her to bring Will Worms. Zenobia was a little surprised, and then asked if Artie understood why they were doing all this. She said they should not allow riots. After that, she asked if Artie understood that. She caught the girl's stern gaze on her. Artie sighed softly, then said that it didn't sound very convincing. Right after that, she said she was sorry. Zenobia noted that everything was fine because Artie had every right to think so. Suddenly Artie mentioned the name of Will Worms, and then mentioned the monster of the disaster. She asked Zenobia if it had anything to do with Tynebris. Zenobia froze. Zenobia turned quickly and looked at Artie. The girl noticed that Zenobia had told her to keep an eye on Will last time. She asked if it had anything to do with the disaster monster. She continued by saying that she thinks sabotage is what Tynebris really fears. Zenobia stopped the girl with a stern expression on her face, after which she asked why she decided that. Artie stopped abruptly. She said that they, the Salvation Army, are an organization that was created to fight cults. She thought reasonably that these thoughts were coming to her, since Zenobia had previously told her to look after this boy. She said that if he really had something to do with the gods, then the cult would consider him a threat and try to destroy him. She noted that it was understandable why this bothered her so much. Artie asked who he was after all. Zenobia stopped the girl, then stared into her eyes. At that moment, she looked worried. Suddenly she smiled broadly and put her hand on Artie's head. She said that the girl was very smart, because she immediately caught the essence of their mission. She said that there were some reasons why she couldn't tell her anything yet but she would soon find out about everything herself. She turned away and waved her hand. Artie awkwardly agreed with her. After that, Artie excused herself and left the office, leaving Zenobia alone with her thoughts. Tynris is exactly what you can call a disaster monster. A cult is a secret community that fanatically supports the beast of disaster or, as it is also called in certain circles, the god of disasters. They are so clearly convinced that they can resurrect the beast and become the strongest race on earth. It is also possible that this may happen soon. She opened her desk drawer, thinking that they needed to hurry up and gather troops of talented warriors, people who can withstand the forces of the beast. She took out a small scroll from the table, which is able to measure a person's magical power. It is attached together with the application for admission. She opened it and thought that she had previously created it in order to quickly find the people they needed, but almost no one could meet the requirements they needed. However, Will Worms was one big exception for them. She was genuinely interested in who this mysterious boy was. At this time, Will was sitting with his elbows on the table. He could barely keep himself awake. He thought about how the number of guardian deities was not included in the entrance exam results. He remembered that Artie had previously told him that if the guardian deity becomes one with a person, then he loses concentration. At that time, little Saria was sleeping on Rune Run's back. She yawned violently. Will thought that if he failed the exam, he could safely return to his hometown and continue to live a peaceful life. He should have enough money for maintenance and food to get Saria back on her feet. Suddenly, the extremely sleepy girl noticed how deeply her brother was lost in thought. She looked at him worriedly and asked if something had happened. She asked if it was possible that he was hungry. Will was so lost in thought that her question caught him off guard. He asked the girl what she was talking about. He smiled and said it was true, and he was a little hungry right now. Hearing this, the girl hurried a little, saying that, in that case, she would give him something. The next moment, the girl took out a small piece of dried meat from her dress and joyfully offered her brother to eat. Seeing this meat, Will was quite surprised. He realized that this was exactly the dried meat that he had previously received from the vassals. At that time, when they still lived in the city, they did not have the opportunity to eat, nor did they have the most decent food. That's why sometimes vassals could share food with them. He realized that Saria had saved a small piece of dried meat because she already knows what hunger is. She was afraid that hunger might overtake them again. Will took the meat from his sister's hands, then looked at her and asked if she was hungry. The girl immediately shook her head, indicating that she was not hungry at all. She smiled sweetly and said that she had already had a little snack before. Right at the very moment she was talking about it, her stomach made loud noises. Will turned pale. Saria said that precisely because she had already eaten, he should take this meat for himself. Will awkwardly thanked his sister for the treats. He took a piece of meat in his hands and smiled. Saria also smiled broadly and told him to have a good meal. Will accepted the gift from his sister and happily took a small bite out of the meat. He said it was really delicious, and Saria smiled broadly. Will leans a little closer to his sister. He wants to tell her something. The boy tells Saria that there seems to be quite a lot of food in the kitchen, 
and smiles. The girl opened her eyes in surprise and was, to put it mildly, shocked by this news. The boy reminds his sister that she can take this food whenever she wants. Then there was no limit to the girl's surprise at all. She definitely did not expect to hear these words from her brother. Will puts his hand on his sister's shoulder. He reminds Saria that she shouldn't keep food in her pocket anymore. Will remembers the past and realizes how hard it was for the girl. Saria smiles sweetly and luxuriates from stroking her cheek with her brother's hand. The girl says that everything is fine with her, because her brother is always with her, and touches the boy's hand with small palms in response. The guy realizes that he should no longer worry too much about Saria, because they will no longer have to experience terrible hunger. He reminds her that the girl can go eat a little in the kitchen, to which she was surprised again. Meanwhile, in the kitchen, Saria still can't believe her eyes, she is mesmerized by the dish in front of her and she has a spoon and fork in her hands, and there is meat with vegetables and other food on the plate. The girl, confused, asks her brother if she can really eat at all. Will smiles broadly at his sister and says that, of course, she can eat as much as she wants without limiting herself. Her brother sits across from the girl and assures her that if Saria eats a lot, she will become as strong and fast as he is. While the guys were sitting at the table, a satisfied Rune Rune came up to them, carrying a small piece of food in his mouth. The girl eats food with both cheeks, she really likes the taste of dishes cooked in the kitchen. Meanwhile, her brother gently wipes her mouth with a napkin and asks her to eat it a little slower. Suddenly, the guy's attention is attracted by the surrounding environment. As it turned out, there are practically no people in the kitchen. All the tables were empty, and there was only one person in the queue at all. The boy assumes that all the students who were supposed to be in the kitchen are currently on field exercises. Will is still thinking and does not understand what is happening, because he also signed up for field exercises. The boy turns to his sister and asks her permission to ask a question. Meanwhile, Saria licks her spoon, getting dirty with food again, and listens attentively to her brother. The girl is interested, and Will asks what happened after he entered school. Saria guesses that her brother is worried about something, and excitedly asks about this condition. Will assures his sister that he is fine. However, the boy notices that sometimes he hears some sounds that make him feel uneasy. He asks if Saria can talk about this situation. She lowers her head, and a deep sadness immediately appears on her face. Saria gathered her resolve, showing it with bent fists and a confident expression on her face, and said that she was fine and that nothing would happen to her if she told her brother. Will patted Saria on the head and praised her, saying that she was doing a great job, deciding to tell him. The girl was pleased with the praise and confirmed Will's words that she was doing well. Saria hugged the slime tightly with happiness. The brother strokes the top of the pet's head and says with a smile that he should give it a name. He named the creature Fury. The girl was unexpectedly surprised that her brother named her pet. Fury gurgled happily, clearly enjoying the owner's stroking on the top of his head. Will suggests that the pet is most likely very happy to be around them. Despite the fact that Saria had called the slime Fury before, the boy had long been used to this name himself. However, he wanted to say that it's official now, and the slime now has its own name. Will thinks that he shouldn't confuse the pet's name anymore, because every time he forgets about it. Although, on the one hand, there is nothing wrong with it. While her brother was thinking, Saria tried to distract his thoughts. Saria is madly outraged and objects to her brother's new idea, because the pet has already been named by that name. The girl hugs the pet as a support. The boy smiles and says that he allegedly remembered this moment. After all, the girl named him that way herself. Will admits that he has already forgotten how his sister named the pet. The girl smiles happily and holds her fury in her arms. Meanwhile, Fury is sitting on the table and smiling. It seems that the pet also likes his name. The boy wonders if this could be another feature of him, because he understands everything Fury wants to say. The boy was determined. Will is happy to say that from now on the pet's name is Fury Fury. The brother and sister are happy to look at the pet, who is smiling proudly, sitting in the same place. Meanwhile, Rune Rune lay down to rest. After some time in the dormitory of the school, the boy changed into a colorful cape, which was worn over a shirt and trousers. He expressed his willingness to hit the road. Saria sincerely wishes good luck to her brother and encourages him, and Rune Rune stands behind the girl and happily wags his tail. At this wonderful moment, there is a knock on the door. A woman's voice is heard outside the door. Artie asks if she can come in. Will invites her guest into the house. A girl with a sword in her belt asks if the boy is ready to hit the road. Will is happy to thank the girl for accompanying him, and wonders if she has any business herself. The girl is firmly convinced that she is free. The guy objects and reminds me that today is a preparatory day. Artie insists on her own anyway and assures Will that she has plenty of free time 
Despite the hectic day of preparation, the dog happily approaches the guest and starts licking her cheeks. At this point, Will wonders if Artie can conduct the briefing as an ordinary assistant, or if she is allowed to accompany the boy. The girl smiles tenderly, responds affectionately to the dog's attentions and scratches him behind the cheek and chin. Artie wonders if he and Will will take Rune Rune and Slime with them. The boy replies that the slime is now called Fury Fury, and this is his official name. The slime happily rubbed against Artie's cheek, and she stroked the pet sitting on her shoulder with her index finger. Will confidently says that if it were possible, he would like to ask Artie to take these animals with him. He has received permission, and Fury is now determined to go on the road too. However, the boy is distracted from his thoughts and heroic ideas and turns to his sister. He had never left Saria alone before. Will wonders if anything could happen if he takes the pets with him. Saria doesn't quite understand her brother's feelings and anxiously asks what happened. Will bends down a little lower and asks his sister's permission to take Rune Rune and Fury Fury with him today. Will wonders if the girl herself can handle it. She says with burning eyes that she will be alright. The boy thanked his sister, patting her on the head, and said that as soon as he was done, they would definitely go to the kitchen for dinner together. Artie approaches the pets and takes baby Saria by the hand. She decides to take the girl to the nursery first, and then go to the place of entrance exams. After Saria was taken to the nursery, Artie and Will went out to the exam venue. It was a large space, more like a square or a square. The boy thanked Artie for accompanying him. The girl wished good luck to the boy and the pets and left. As soon as Will waved after her, a rude tone was heard behind her. Behind the boy stood two rather extraordinary guys in solid suits. One of them objects and asks to draw the attention of those around them. The second guy picks up on the idea and notices that these crooks turn up their noses like they are kings and walk around here. Will doesn't pay the slightest attention and doesn't even turn around at the sarcastic barbs. The guys turn Will around to face them. They practically scream and ask how dare he ignore them. Rune Rune responds to such a gesture towards his master with an angry growl. The guys start shouting that Will dared to disobey one of the legitimate heirs of the Worm's family, and therefore disobeyed the Worm's family. The armored guard asks to stop the brawl, to which his colleague reminds that these two guys are from a rich family and no one dares to contradict them, and asks the guard to calm down. The surrounding people gradually begin to turn their attention to the guys and gather around them. One of the passers-by readily notices that the Worm's family has four guardian deities each. Will closes his eyes in annoyance and does not understand at all what others are talking about. After all, the boy has no idea who they are and what kind of deities they have, since everyone has made such a fuss. One of the guys hopes that Will will not run away, otherwise it will be very sad for him to end everything this way. The bully said he'd be pretty offended if Will chickened out and just walked away. The guy does not fully understand why Will does not pay attention to him and asks with displeasure that he is digging there. Will replies that he calms his dog down because he can tear two guys to pieces. The guy gets mad to the point of impossibility and says whether the boy is listening to their words at all. Rune Rune expresses his emotions more and more angrily and is fully ready to pounce on the offenders. Will turns around and repeats the words. His eyes are burning, and he asks in disbelief if those two really think he can get cold feet. The guys clearly did not expect such a turn and were immensely surprised by the boy's reaction. Will had already turned his full attention to the guys. He turns to them and with an evil expression on his face asks how one of them even dared to think that Will could get scared like that and call the boy names. Will almost shouted and said that these two were just brats. He advised them to shut their mouths and not disgrace their well-known surname. The guys were undoubtedly shocked by such a performance in their direction. A tall guy from the Worms family clarifies what the boy said and was already about to deal with him when his brother blocks his way and asks him to wait because he intends to talk to him himself. The second brother holds his nose high above Will and wonders if he also has a guardian deity. The boy does not quite understand what the second brother is driving at, and he asks if Will's deity can compete with the deities of the Worms family, because there are four of them. Someone from the surrounding people asked about the four guardians of the Worms family, because it was hard to believe. He was told that this was true, because they were famous people. The second brother bared his teeth and ordered Wilk to answer, because he was already tired of waiting. The boy agreed. The Worms brothers did not expect Will to accept their offer and smiled broadly. The tall brother said that he did not hear the boy's answer, one of them thought that he should ask again. Will exhales heavily. He says that, as it seems to him, the guy is in trouble not only with his head, 
but also with his hearing. Two, if he did not hear the answer. The surrounding people were still watching this picture and were surprised by such a sharp response from the boy. The brothers bared their teeth again and glared at Will. One of the brothers said he couldn't live. The guys went on to insult Will towards his family and said he didn't belong here. Will was completely annoyed by this, but he still waited patiently. One of the brothers noticed this and suggested the idea that the boy could not even move his hand, since he was standing in place without the slightest movement. Will begins to spin the glove in his hand with great speed. A second later, the garment slams into the offender's face with great force. Will wonders if this is really all that one of the brothers of such a great worm's family is capable of. The boy is firmly convinced that he will never forgive the vile, and low insults of his family and threats in his direction. One of the brothers realizes that Will challenged him to a duel. The boy turns to the guy and with sarcastic mockery asks why he is trembling. Is such a big guy scared of some eight-year-old child with one deity? The guy was about to object, as he immediately received a second glove in the face. Will was sure that this was to be expected. He explains that he challenged the Worms brothers to a duel because they can only talk with their tongues. Responding to the boy's next barbs, the guys looked at him in disbelief and asked if he really was completely crazy. The tall brother grinned, but still accepted the boy's bold offer. He leans over to the boy and puts forward his conditions. If Will loses, he must kneel in front of the Worms brothers. The boy agreed and asked when the long-awaited start of the duel would be. The second brother literally goes into a scream and asks how the boy can be so calm. Because his Worms brothers can just eat him alive. Will says in a barely audible voice that in this duel, most likely, everything will be quite the opposite. Will reminds me that now it's time to listen to his terms. If the boy wins, the two brothers will visit his mother's grave and ask her forgiveness for all that they said earlier. The guys responded with a ringing and disgusting laugh and said that the boy would not win even if heaven and earth changed places with each other. Suddenly, one of the passers-by said that it was time for the brothers to stop talking. Otherwise the duelists might be late for the written exam, and called for an unexpected duel to begin. A guy stood quietly to the side, he is the examiner. He said it was forbidden to arrange duels between students without permission from above. Will explained that he wasn't even a student yet. However, the visitor replied that even candidates are treated like students, so the boy is also considered. The Worms brothers wonder why this boy is not afraid of anything at all, because their words and threats do not take him. The guy who said about the ban on dueling objected that, in that case, he would undoubtedly be the duelist of the brothers. The brothers objected with perplexity and reminded the examiner about today's written exam. However, the guy who came expressed his most sincere desire to also participate in the duel. The guy said that it was getting late, and the written exam could wait a bit. The boy was still sure that he would not calm down. Will won't be able to focus on the written test until he restores his late mother's honor. Will understands that he has a great opportunity, because if he goes to the academy, then no family will ever be able to threaten him anymore. At this time, the examiner assures the children that the brothers and the boy may be late. After the duel, he promises to show them the location of the test. The duel is sanctioned by the academy and Will promises that he will repay all his debts as soon as he deals with the guys. He promises to do this for the sake of his father, mother and Saria. Will will have to put those nasty braggarts in their place in order to make it to the entrance exam. The examiner points to the place for the duel and adds that the opponents can compete here to their heart's content. He repeats the conditions. If Will wins, the two Worms brothers will apologize to his mother. If Worms wins, then the boy himself will leave the academy, but before that he will be forced to admit his absolute defeat. The boy calmly announced that he understood absolutely all the conditions, and the brothers expressed their impatience and desire to quickly start a duel and test their strength in a duel, showing who is actually the best candidate for students of the academy. The guy asks the boy with interest if he thinks such an outcome is fair, because the brothers, in fact, will not lose anything, even if they lose. Will says he doesn't mind it at all, so he's fine. The examiner asks the boy for the last time if he can cope with his brothers, because there are two of them. The boy calmly replies that he is not alone either. At this moment, Rune Rune is sitting on the podium and happily looks at his master. Fury Fury is sitting on his head. The organizer asks the boy if he can still fight one-on-one. -on -one because it will be according to the rules. The tall brother shrugs his shoulders and says that they will quickly deal with this boy, because they constantly laugh at the weak. He runs his tongue over his lips predatorily and thinks that he will deal with the boy without even having time to blink an eye. The organizer of the duel says that if all parties agree, then you can start the duel. The examiner leaves the podium. He sincerely hopes that the duel will not take much time, 
and the guys will quickly sort it out among themselves. The brothers begin to take a fighting stance, while the boy stands calmly and whistles. One of the guys is perplexed and asks the boy with interest about what he is doing. Will notices that the tall brother is quite noisy. Will said before the fight that the brothers would have to attack him first. In response, the brothers immediately attack the boy with a predatory attack. They summon their magic powers, and magic circles appeared in front of their hands. They urge the boy to get ready to experience all their strength and supposedly boundless power. Will admits that these two are really strong. The boy dodges to the side and a moment later a huge shockwave passes by him. The surrounding people are surprised by the performance, because a huge cloud of dust and pieces of tiles appeared in place of the shockwave. One of the brothers began to proudly praise the other for hitting the boy with such force. The tall brother laughed and reminded that no one had ever managed to defeat him. Meanwhile, Will was already standing behind his brother, and noticed that the guy was too confident in himself, since he thought that with this extraordinary blow he could immediately neutralize him and even more so defeat him. His brother was just about to turn around. But at that moment the boy had already blocked his movements by grabbing and twisting one arm back. Will grabs brother Worms by the neck and presses his cheek firmly to the ground. With a completely ordinary technique, without using magic, Will has already dealt with one of the arrogant brothers. He was lying on the ground, saying that he was in great pain, and plaintively asked to be released. The second brother of the group turned to Will and asked what he was doing. The guy started using magic power. Will notices that if a guy uses magic, he will inadvertently hurt his brother. The second brother objected that the boy was just afraid. Will didn't understand and asked why the guy decided that. At this time, the tall brother was lying on the ground and did not understand how the boy was able to grab him so that he could not move. The boy asks, squeezing the neck of the defeated man, if he has already lost confidence in himself. The boy, holding his grip, says that he can beat him in two counts but he likes to torment his opponent. The tall brother asks to stop squeezing his neck. The second brother, who was miraculously lucky not to get hit and stay free, went on a scream and asked the boy to stop treating them so rudely, because they were simply just joking with him. Will closed his eyes, sighing hopelessly. He understands that there is not much point in this fight. At this time, my brother was lying on the floor and trying to catch his breath, and drops of sweat were flowing down his face. Suddenly, the brother, who was held in a strong grip, screamed and began waving his arms, and bitter tears poured out of his eyes. Will said he would give him some time to come to his senses and attack each other honestly later. The boy does not think that they will end the duel quickly. He hopes that he will be able to attack them, because he cannot lose, because then he will not have time to get to the entrance exam at all if they hurt him even a little. Will decides that he needs to eliminate these two brothers as soon as possible and end this whole boring circus. While Will was thinking, the two guys regained their resolve and accepted the boy's offer. The Worms brothers began to invoke magic again and use various spells. The atmosphere was so unusual that even the surrounding people noticed it and were surprised. The brothers summoned a dark cloud from which countless wasps flew out. It turned out to be black magic. The surrounding people began to panic, because they could not see anything around in this dark cloud. The boy immediately realized that their magic is very strong, and therefore it is necessary to attack quickly, without delay. One of the brothers asks with a grin if Will is ready for battle, and calls on his opponent to fight. Will promised himself he would find a way to stop their partially forbidden move without embarrassment. If they use black magic, then most likely the management will have a lot of questions for them. Will stands calmly and, with his hand outstretched to the side, summons his magic. A white light appeared in the palm of his hand, and Will says that guys do not cause significant problems for him at all. One of the brothers starts laughing loudly and hysterically and asks the boy what he can do with his meager and unimaginative magic. At this moment, Will launches a light ball formed a couple of moments ago into a dark cloud. Will concentrates and says that he will need a little more time. Literally in a moment, the magic ball bursts into a huge space and becomes fiery. It turns out that the ability of this magic circle is to absorb mundane insects and incinerate them afterwards. Will was immensely pleased and proud that the quickly planned stunt was a success. The brothers were extremely unhappy and looked at the boy in surprise, because he destroyed their magic with one movement of his hand. They did not believe that it was even possible to pull off such a thing against their unimaginable strength. The Worms brothers got really angry and began to release magical techniques without a break, trying to impress the boy as much as possible. They decided to do everything to make Will lose confidence in himself. The brothers released the magic of earth and wind. These forces are completely different in attributes but they are quite similar in strength. Meanwhile, a wind vortex and stone spikes coming out of the ground were heading towards Will. 
will skillfully dodges first the stone spikes and then the wind flow. He admits that he was almost hit by one of the techniques. The brothers decide to urgently use another spell before Will gets out of the cycle of attacks. Ivan's guardians are the god of insects and the god of the earth. And the tall brother of Dan has the god of the wind and the god of the earth. Will has a couple of questions for the brothers' keepers. He promises that the next time he enters the world of deities, he will definitely ask why they chose these brothers. The surrounding people were amazed, because the boy copes with two pillars perfectly. It was an incredible sight. Another man picked up on the idea and said that in a few moments the duel would be over, because the guys had almost run out of magic. The examiner stood silently on the sidelines and thought that the outcome of the battle had long been predetermined for both sides. A girl approaches the organizer from the side and asks with true interest how the battle of Will Worms is going. The guy assumes that Ari approached him. The girl disagreeably objects, adjusts her scarf and says that she is Ari. The organizer turns to the girl and says that she can see everything with her own eyes, she just has to wait for the result. The two discuss a magical attack with the strengthening of the physical circulation of magic that will use. It was truly amazing, because such a thing is beyond the power of a child. The guys wondered how he used it then. The examiner confirms that the boy maneuvered and, dodging an attacking blow, knocked the opponent to the ground. You can't do this in a second and concentrate properly, it takes years of hard training. The organizer notices and tells the girl that with such force as wills, he can knock down not only a man, but also a big beast. Artie looks intently at the boy who is fighting a duel hard. At this time, the guy continues and says that Will very quickly saved a three-year-old child from a blow, reacting instantly, and not even getting a single scratch. The organizer believes that the girl also noticed this moment a long time ago. Artie turns around and says that she needs to step away for a while. The organizer does not fully understand and curiously asks why the girl is not interested in seeing who will win the duel, and looks after her. It seemed to everyone that the fight had been over for a long time. Will confidently asks his opponents if their keepers have already run out of steam so quickly. The brothers immediately turn sarcastically to Will. The boy said that it was time to finish this performance, and the magic in his palm began to fade away. Instead of a weak fading magic, two flaming balls appear. The Worms brothers look at the magic that has appeared with incomprehension. They did not understand what kind of substance appeared from the boy's palm. It was something with the water. While they were looking at the magic spheres, Will asked if they would like to play with him for a while, using magic. Without waiting for an answer, the boy threw the magic spheres towards the brothers and pointed his fingers in the direction of the attack. Two slightly shapeless magic spheres hit exactly on target, right in the faces of the Worms brothers. It turned out to be a water trap. The water enveloped the brothers' heads, and they were forced to hold their breath so as not to drown. Meanwhile, Will set a condition, because if the brothers do not admit defeat, they may well suffocate. Will asks again because he thinks his brothers didn't hear what he was saying. He holds back the magic and notices that, despite the fact that the brothers have four guardian deities, they cannot cope with one of them, who uses the simplest techniques. Will thinks that they should practice hard to be able to fight back. While the boy was thinking about this with deep interest, his attention was attracted by the fact that the brothers unexpectedly decided to drink water spheres for everyone. Will hadn't thought this through. The Worms brothers drank all the water, and their bellies immediately grew much larger. They say that the boy should not think at all that they can be dealt with just like that. Will said that he did not intend to give up just after seeing their puffed up bellies. The brothers were surprised by such a sudden conclusion, and a loud voice was heard from the side, which called for the end of the duel. The boy understood the instruction about the end of the duel, and began to control magic again. Suddenly, water began to gurgle in Dan's stomach. Both brothers clutched their bellies, they really wanted to go to the toilet. The boy understands, because they drank a lot of liquid. He tells the guys that they'd better give up and run to the bathroom before it's too late. Ivan, who has countless drops of sweat on his face, says that he will never do that. The brothers began to literally scream that it would be better if the boy dealt with them with other techniques. Will thought that they had lost their minds altogether and reminded them that right now they could relieve themselves here, in a duel in front of the enemy. After these sudden, but quite obvious words of the boy, the Worms brothers suddenly have stomachs, only they are no longer able to control their body. A terrible fetid smell began to spread around the Worms brothers, which immediately attracted a cloud of annoying insects. The guys themselves had tears running out of their eyes, and their eyes began to roll up. Ivan and Dan understand that they have disgraced themselves in full in front of crowds of people. The surrounding people looked with disapproval and noted that this was a very pitiful sight, and a complete disappointment for the brothers from a famous family. 
At this time, Will realizes that he humiliated the guys in front of everyone and maybe he overdid it a little bit. The people around said the same thing, that the guys should definitely be ashamed and they should have given up much earlier. Seeing the face of one of the brothers, the boy realized that he had done the right thing after all. After all, they themselves stubbornly insisted on fighting him. Will noticed that the Worms brothers were still stubborn and still didn't accept defeat. Then Will grabbed the shirt collars of the arrogant brothers and abruptly pulled them towards him. He pointed out that they should not even dare to approach him and his sister anymore. The Worms brothers were already completely horrified by such a loud statement and the menacing appearance of the boy, and because of this they could not say anything in response, as if they had filled their mouths with water. The boy said loudly that the fight was definitely over now. Will understands that it was a little cruel to impose an intimidating voice with magic, but he believes that the guys definitely deserved it. Will turns to the guys last of all. He misunderstandingly asks if their deities are worthy to be their guardians. While the boy was holding the hooligans by the shirts, suddenly a strange light glow began to appear around his hands. Then the organizer arrived and asked Will if he was okay. The boy agreed, and then the organizer stepped into the arena for the duel and announced its end. The guy raises the boy's hand and says that Will won. Will admits to the organizer that he is very sorry that it happened. The boy sincerely volunteers to help with the cleaning of the ring. The examiner admits that there is no need for this and they can quite cope on their own, without anyone's help. And suddenly the attention of the organizer is attracted by Artie, who has brought two people in robes with her. Two mysterious people asked Will Worms to follow them directly. One of the visitors gave an order to the examiner that the exam was not cancelled and asked to take care of it. The guy stood still and listened attentively to the instruction. In addition, the man in the robe said that Artie would supervise the work. The boy was still not far behind with an offer to help with the tedious cleaning of the ring before the exams. All he gets in return is that he shouldn't worry about such little things at all. Artie begins to explain that the golem will clean the room automatically, you just need to press the switch. Will was amazed by this kind of technology. While Artie was showing the golem, the two in robes called the boy to follow them. Artie looked down and shyly thanked the boy for his heartfelt kindness. He said that the girl should not say thanks, because because of him, the Worms brothers stained the entire ring for exams. Will apologized once again for the way things turned out and he couldn't prevent it. Leaving, the boy called his pets, faithful guides, Rune Rune and Fury Fury and went on. He is accompanied by two people in robes. They skillfully hide their magical abilities, but the boy had a feeling that something was wrong. Most likely, they are blocking their power so Will cannot feel it. If these mysterious people represent more than one organization, then this proves once again that Artie is their student. They definitely want to defeat the monster of disaster, Will has no doubt about it. The people with the boy reached a certain place and pointed to the entrance. In front of Will, it would seem, there is an ordinary corridor and a window. There is a collection of fighting swords hanging on the wall nearby, which the boy remembers, because these swords belong to someone. From deep thought, Will is distracted by a girl who has taken off the hood of her robe from her head, who jumps on his back literally shouting about how long it has been since they saw each other. She addresses him as a master with immense joy and a smile on her face. The girl notes that Will has become very cute. The boy, in response, asks to loosen his grip and let him go. The girl hugs Will strongly from behind and says that she really wanted to meet her teacher. At this time, he looks at the collection of swords, remembering that Zenobia once used these swords. Will has absolutely no doubt that this nimble girl, who is almost crying and hugging the boy more and more, is Zenobia, and she knows exactly who the guy was in his previous life. Will analyzes all the facts and begins to talk about the fact that, apparently, the girl is Zenobia. She happily agrees, not at all intending to get off Will's back. Will begins to scold the girl, which makes her completely taken aback. He did not understand, otherwise, why and why run up and hug a stranger from behind, to which Zenobia is only stunned and looks at her teacher. He continues to reproach her further and say that on top of everything, they never looked at each other's face at all. Suddenly, the girl could hug hug someone she didn't want to see at all, maybe. Zenobia's eyes filled with bitter tears. She lowered her head and at the same moment began to sincerely justify herself by saying that she immediately felt without mistakes that this was her teacher. Will began to calm the girl down. At this moment, a second man in a robe comes up from behind and, removing a large hood, asks for an opportunity to explain himself to Will. The newcomer turned out to be Milt without any doubt. The man understands and agrees that a lot of time has passed since the last meeting with the master. Will notices that he felt the energy as soon as the man took off the hood of his robe. Such exceptional and unusual magic can only belong to Milt. 
The man smiles warmly and, without hiding his curiosity, asks if the boy is surprised to be taken away. He explains that four of his students are now acting as the president of this academy. Milt says that he immediately recognized the master through identification and with the help of another item. This item turned out to be a magic scroll that Milt pulled out. The scroll is attached to the questionnaire in order to measure the amount of magical power of the subject in advance. Indeed, Will had already filled out this form before. The boy remembers that when he filled out this questionnaire, he realized that it was very much like a magic scroll. Milt says that he was immediately sent this scroll so that he could make sure that it was definitely the master. At first Milt thought that a child had been born who had simply adopted the qualities of their beloved master. Milt is interrupted by Zenobia and explains that this is why they decided to observe the master for a while. To keep an eye on Will, they sent Artie to him so that she would look after the boy and accompany him everywhere. Will begins to guess that Artie is Zenobia's student and generously praises her ward. Zenobia proudly admits that it is her duty to raise the same worthy student that their master raised. Milt says that if he had become a child who inherited the qualities of a master, he would have followed his teacher without the slightest doubt. Will objects and says that Milt, without objections, would make a good teacher. Milt had heard somewhere that the guardian deity was considered an apostle, and it seemed that the gods loved these annoying worms brothers very much, since they stayed with them no matter what. Will, in turn, was amazed that Milt hadn't changed at all. Milt explains that then in a mad rush he checked the history of the measuring device's log. It turned out that the child is the unconditional reincarnation of the master and that he is an apostle. At this moment, a thought strikes Will. He does not remember that the goddess warned him about such a thing. He only remembers her hope that the boy would behave well because he is an apostle and asks not to forget about it. Milt goes on to say that he noticed something in the recent duel. Milt remembered how the master had once shown him some spells that should be used to accurately destroy an opponent. Will often use this spell to cause his opponent to have relentless diarrhea. Memories arise in my head of how the master used the same tricks in a previous life. Will is surprised that he used this abomination in a previous life. When Zenobia was about five years old, she asked Will to shave half of her head. The girl confirmed this with burning eyes, remembering such moments. Zenobia took the boy by the shoulders and asked him to discard the details, because more than 200 years have passed. She took him aside and said that it was time to get new stories. The girl is very interested in what the master was doing when he was in heaven. Will admits that the goddess told him about the current situation, but, unfortunately, he now has a total of about 8 years of knowledge. Zenobia enthusiastically asks to tell everything. Milt looks and certainly understands that the boy listens to everything, but does not fully grasp the situation at all. A couple of hours later, Will understands what has been said. He mentions the cult of Tynbris. Milt confirms and says that they, the rescue squad, were nevertheless created to fight this cult. During the conversation, Rune Run was contentedly eating food from a plate. However, knowing that the Beast of Calamity did not die, now the first priority is to prevent its resurrection. Will wonders if even such a powerful organization as the Salvation Squad can't interfere with the cult's actions. Milt explains that most fanatics are ordinary, unremarkable people, but, as it turned out, at the center of all this is a demon who has the ability to control them. Will asks who this demon is. Milt explains to the guys that demons are very powerful creatures. They definitely do not belong to those who have strong vital and magical powers that can be easily subdued. If you compare the fighting power of a human with a medium-sized dog, then the fighting power of demons is a lion. Even the disciples who somehow become the strongest warriors in the future cannot defeat him because of his unimaginable strength. Milt says that some information was not confirmed even before the death of the master. The fact is that even more powerful demons have appeared. But they were able to defeat them with the help of four students. Will couldn't believe what he was hearing. Milt goes on to say that these demons were once the same kind of fanatics worshipping the beast of catastrophes. However, their strength increased and they became uncontrollable monsters. Will did not believe that a person could become a demon. He sincerely admits that, despite the fact that he trained to defeat the monster of catastrophes, it seems to him that this is now an impossible task for him. Milt objects and says that they are very happy that they have finally found a master. Milt says that they are very interested in hearing Will's story, especially the master's training in heaven. The boy asks again and reminds him that he still returned after a hundred years. Milt grins and says that time has flown by completely unnoticed, and he is not the same young guy at all. Will grins and says that even though Milt is 120 years old, he still can't look more than 60. Milt, with a serious expression on his face, says that his appearance is supported by an internal magical force, 
so he does not look his age. Tears appear in the man's eyes, and he pathetically pronounces the name of the master. Zenobia laughed and asked the man if he had been holding back his emotions all this time. Milt agreed and asked if he could finally cry, because he thought he would never find a master. The girl let him, and decided to say something for the future. She thinks it would be better for the master to become a student at the academy, and hide his eventful past. Will objects and says that he needs to take the entrance exams first, and going to the academy just like that would be cheating. I immediately remember the image of the organizer of the duel. The guy said that Will defeated two disciples with four deities. The exquisite maneuvering of fire and water balls is also a kind of master class. That examiner will recommend Will for admission. The examiner said that Will is good at everything, so he will pass without exams. Milt took the glass with the drink in his hands and asked to notify Dion and Regin that the master was here. Will wonders how they can be told. Milt explains that for these purposes he uses a summoning ring that he created himself. He undertakes to give the ring to the master a little later. Will is surprised that a man could create something like this. The boy says that, as in the case of the measuring device, Milt is simply excellent. The man is very proud of his work and tears started pouring out of his eyes again. He apologizes and excuses himself by saying that he has very weak tear glands. The man passes his hand, describing an even circle and explains that first you need to open this ring and then click on the pattern and contact Dion and Redina. Milt checks the connection and asks if the interlocutors are all right. At the other end of the conversation, they respond by saying that everything is fine with them, and the connection is quite good. Dion, being on the battlefield, explains that Milt has finally contacted them, and asks with interest what important news they want to tell him urgently. On the same battlefield, a girl in armor and a big bat, Regina, passes by and asks to speak a little briefly due to the fact that she is a little busy. After hearing all the recommendations, Milt, listening in this way, asks to listen to him very carefully. Milt declares that the master was reborn and appeared with two divine beasts. At the other end of the conversation, Regina and Dion ask if the master is with Milt. They ask the master to say something if he hears them in order to hear his voice. Will approaches the magic ring and touchingly remembers the names of his friends. He says that not even a hundred years have passed. Dion clearly did not expect such a turn of events, because so much time has passed since she did not become a master. Will says that he is very glad to hear their voices. He promises to tell all the events in much more detail at a personal meeting. The guys agree and reciprocate that they are also glad to hear from their master. Will hangs up and says he's seeing the guys soon. Milt explains this by saying that time has already run out. After a few seconds of conversation, the boy has no doubt that after a hundred years, all the guys have not changed at all. Will noticed that Milt was still the same crybaby, and the man immediately felt embarrassed. A woman's voice was heard outside the door. Artie asks if she can come in. Zenobia gave permission and the door swung open, and the girl walked confidently into the room. Zenobia immediately began to explain with great interest to her student that Will would continue to study here, so Artie would look after him and should always be by the boy's side. Zenobia explains to her student that Will is going to become a student, and a member of the rescue squad. Therefore, Artie must make sure that he does not disgrace their honor. At this time, Artie wonders if the boy can even join so easily. Zenobia gently puts her hand on her student's shoulder and says that she does not doubt her abilities at all, so she counts on her help for the boy. The student agrees without argument. The girl was quite a bit depressed, but after a moment she expressed that she had one small suggestion and asked for permission to voice it. Artie, with a confident expression and attitude, asks Zenobia and Milt if she can also study at the academy with Will. Zenobia had not expected such a question at all and was surprised by Artie's suggestion. The newcomer explained that she had already acted in front of the examinees as an assistant in the management of the exam, and there is nothing more natural in being a student who has long decided to become an assistant director. She asks and hopefully seeks confirmation of her thoughts from the teacher. Zenobia patted the student on the head with some concern and said that this was undoubtedly a great idea. The girl happily thanked her teacher. Zenobia turns to Will and asks if he agrees to Artie's interesting idea. Will agreed without further ado. Even if this is done in order to hide his identity, the boy is no longer used to such a manner of communication. Will and Artie shake hands. The boy is incredibly happy that he will have the opportunity to cooperate with the girl. She also reciprocates. Zenobia asks, not without interest, if Artie has brought her any important reports. The girl recalls the report, which contained all the information about the exam. Artie reports that the exam passed without any difficulties, and 30 people were selected who passed the threshold. 
Milt emphasizes that the situation is quite common for such an event. Zenobia asks sternly if anyone had serious injuries during or before the exam. Artie remembers about Dan and Ivan Worms, who were seriously injured. Will began to worry that there could be such serious consequences after his attacks. Artie calms him down and says that they undoubtedly received these wounds after the boy defeated them. As soon as they came to their senses, they decided to teach the master a lesson again and take revenge by leaving the hospital wing in order to find Will. They found a large jar of poisonous insects somewhere in an unusual way and wanted to pour them out on the master. However, everything did not go according to plan, and worms, for some reason, could not control the rampant insects. The poisonous bugs instantly spread over their bodies and bit hard, leaving numerous wounds. Eventually, they were taken back to hospital beds and are now undergoing treatment. In the end, they don't even have the strength to get out of bed. Artie thinks that they will try to escape again and find the master. It's only a matter of time. Anyway, the Worms brothers can't see anything right now because they've damaged their faces. The examiner does not envy their guardian deities at all. Artie suddenly announces that Ivan and Dan Worms are now at the pole at number zero. Zenobia and Milt look at the girl in disbelief. Milt and Zenobia begin to talk violently and argue with each other. The man and the girl do not understand how mysteriously an ordinary person can somehow contact the apostle. Milt believes that the probability that they will be able to contact him is about 0%. Both ask the master if such an outcome is possible, almost turning to a whisper. At this time, Will thinks it's worth asking the deities directly about it. Will found himself in the world of deities. The master is met by the same goddess who spoke to him last time, and not without interest asks him, clarifying whether he used the device she handed him earlier again. The goddess asks why he came. She guesses that Will probably wants to ask about those close relatives. The guy does not quite understand how the goddess guessed this and asks if she was spying on him all this time. Will guessed that the deity had been shamelessly watching over him for a while and asked her about this situation. She replied with embarrassment that it had happened by itself. The goddess gracefully points her finger up and curiously asks Will if he knows why he did not receive the blessing. After a moment, she continues and says that it all happened just because Will himself took it away. After all, at one point he declared that he did not even deserve to touch two deities with his hands. Will recalls this incident and believes that it is possible and true that he once said these words. The goddess reminds Will that he is a real apostle. In other words, the messenger of God. Will does not fully understand and asks with an interested look if the apostle can have such an ability. The goddess explains that if the gods hadn't disturbed her last time she met Will, she would have been able to explain it all properly. She recalls that at that moment she was trying to tell the boy everything. He asks, not without interest, who these apostles look like. The girl explains that she will have to tell him the next time he visits her. Will is keenly interested in why the Worms brothers had as many as four deities. The goddess grins sweetly and realizes that the boy does not change at all with time. She explains that the gods cannot choose a person based on qualities. They are not interested in the individuality of a person, and they just help them because it is necessary. In some ways, this can even be considered irresponsible. The goddess says that she is also far from omnipotent. She emphasizes that this situation is quite ridiculous, since even the most unsuccessful people are guarded by deities. The boy certainly agrees with her words. Will's appearance in the divine world begins to slowly dissolve and lose its clear outlines, and the goddess guesses that it is time for the boy to return to his world. She sorrowfully regrets that she will be left here in deep solitude again. Despite this, she still urges not to let the boy look into this world often, and the master is interested in the reason for such a request. The goddess explains that if he often comes to this world, his consciousness will sooner or later become clouded and he will die. Will realize that this is actually a serious problem. The goddess informs that she will definitely figure out how to contact her later in such a way that his foot does not set foot in their world, since he is not yet a god. After Will visits the world of the gods, Milt says that the master really has a lot of power. He explains that it all happened because of reincarnation. Milt explains that the time axis between the worlds is different, which is why people can't stay there for a long time. Will finds this a plus and says that it will help him practice. Later, Will was given plans for the future. After saying goodbye to the guys, he returned to Saria. A few days later, Will and his sister Saria are sitting in the park while she is playing with her beloved pets. Will remembers Milt's words that the result will be announced in a week, and the long-awaited ceremony will take place on the same day. Therefore, the boy must be ready. Will didn't understand why he was so relaxed. The boy is distracted from his thoughts by his sister. She picks up the cat and asks her brother to pay attention to her. 
Will urges the girl not to go too far. The boy closes his eyes with peace and realizes that here he can be alone with his thoughts for a while, and not worry about anything at all. An image of a mysterious girl in a hat appears next to the boy. When she found Will, she exclaimed with great joy that he was exactly what she needed. She shook Will's hand tightly, and he guessed that this was the woman who was attacked in the woods last time. The girl says that she definitely does not have the words to express all her gratitude for the help at that dangerous moment. She was about to start telling the story when the boy interrupted her and asked her to stop the endless stream of words. He explains his action by saying that the girl just needed help at that moment, so he volunteered to help her. He introduces himself to the girl as Will Worms. She puts the pens in the lock in front of her and asks if this is the boy from the most famous Worms family. The man in armor who stood behind the girl chuckled, reminding the lady of the rules of decency. She immediately apologized for not introducing herself earlier. She sat down a little, lifting the hem of her colorful dress. She introduced herself as the third princess of the Ermati family, Tina Daya Ermati. She says it's a great honor for her to meet Will. The kingdom of Bariadoa, adjacent to the northeast, is the Ermati Empire. The master always had a good relationship with the Ermati emperors in his previous life. However, the second name in the royal family is quite rare. The girl explains that the name Daya was received from Lord Dion the other day. The girl also explains that students always get the second names of their teachers. For example, a student of Edelfus, Edelsinobia and Zenondian gets the middle name Daya. The boy notes that at such a young age she received a second name, which means she is worthy of praise. The girl admits that the third princess is unlikely to inherit the throne. Therefore, she is very happy to be at this academy on the recommendation of Lord Dion and receive a proper education here. Saria goes up to her brother and calls him. Will introduces his little sister to Tina. Pets were also not left without attention. The girl in the hat bends down in front of the girl and smiles sweetly, greeting her. Will explains that Tina is now their friend, so you need to be friendly to her. Tina was very surprised. After all, the guy said that they are friends now. Tina didn't have any friends at school, and this moment made her happy without the slightest doubt. She tilted her head so that the huge brims of the hat covered her eyes. The girl took Will's palms in her hands and said decisively that she would definitely not cause any problems. She is very happy to make friends with the boy and his company. At the time of this confession, Tina had already been called. The girl said that she was very sorry to say goodbye like that. Saria waved sweetly at the girl, and she said that they would definitely see each other again. The guy was surprised that a number of people in uniform bowed to him. He receives a bow from the royal soldiers, and some of them were barely grinning. One of them asked her highness, Tina, for something. Will notice this familiar face. Saria, with a deeply worried expression on her face, asks about what happened to her brother, to which she receives the answer that everything is fine with him and the girl has nothing to worry about. He lovingly offers his sister Saria to play something, stroking her head. The girl is immensely pleased with this offer and exclaimed contentedly. While the brother was serenely spending time with his sister, a silhouette standing behind a tree nearby was watching them. This silhouette turned out to be an unfamiliar man with cat ears and sharp claws in rather unusual clothes. While Saria was sleeping peacefully on the bench, not knowing the worries, Will and Artie were training hard. The boy held his hands out in front of him, and the girl held the hilt of the sword tightly in her hands. Both students are already completely exhausted and exhausted. But despite the fatigue knocking them down, they are still even more determined to continue intensive and persistent training. After some preparation, Artie swung the ball, putting her hands behind her head. Before Will could blink, the blade of a sharp sword appeared in front of him in an instant. The boy stopped the girl's incredibly fast strike by grabbing the sword between two palms. Will held the sword in his hands for a while, and then got as close to Artie as possible. With one deft movement, he grabbed her by the shoulder and knocked her to the ground. The girl managed to group her body and skillfully landed on her knees. She was amazed that with one light movement, Will stopped her swift attack. Meanwhile, Will raised his sword and at the same moment pointed it at the girl. Then Artie said that she still had to give up. It seems that now she really understands why the teacher called Will a master. The boy is happy that he and Artie had a full workout. At the end of the workout, my sister wakes up and yawns loudly. The girl sweetly rubs her sleepy eyes and says that she has already woken up. When she saw Artie with her brother, she greeted the girl, and after a couple of moments sad tears appeared in her eyes. Saria was upset that she had overslept Artie's entire game with her brother. Will turns to the girl and asks if it's time for her to leave. Artie agrees and nods his head, sheathing his sword. Saria approaches Artie and, almost crying, asks if she is in a hurry. The girl pulls Artie's shirt sleeve and asks her if she can stay and play with her a little more. 
Artie was struck by the touching look of the girl, who almost had tears coming from the fact that Artie was going to leave. Artie calmly agreed to stay, but only for a short time. The girl exclaimed with joy. Thus, the week flew by in the blink of an eye. The results of the entrance exams have long been posted. Will already knows them all. The boy decides to pretend that he is still looking at the results, otherwise other students may suspect him of something. Seria, with genuine curiosity, asks her brother if his name is there, and Will agrees. Will notices that there are no names of Ivan and Dan on the lists. The voice that greets the boy distracts from the thought. He turns around and sees a girl with cat ears and claws. She confidently raises her hand up as a friendly greeting and calls herself Rosetta. The girl standing behind Rosetta is her sister whose name is Rosa. Rosa smiles and immediately rushes to Saria with hugs. It is immediately clear that she is glad to see her friend. At this time, Will is surprised and asks if his sister knows this girl. Saria explains to her brother that she has already played with her, and not without interest asks her brother if he remembers the day when it was. Will remembers this moment and says that he is also glad to see the girl. Will thanks Rosetta for taking care of his sister. In response, the girl explains that Rosa is happy to find and make friends with a new friend. Rosetta is happy to say that she has passed the entrance exam. Therefore, starting this year, she will also study at this academy. Will praises her and says it's very good. He knows that Rosetta was following him and his sister last time. Rosetta looks at the boy in surprise and curiously asks how he found out about this. Will explains that he did not have a sense of threat, so he did not worry about it. The girl scratches behind her ear and says that she was just a little worried after hearing their conversation. Will asks Rosetta not to apologize, because he would have done exactly the same thing in her place. Will holds out his hand to the girl and says that if their sisters are friends, then he also sincerely hopes to get along with Rosetta. The girl stretches out her hand and shakes it. She completely agrees with the boy's words. Saria notices that her brother is also very happy to meet her, and Rose notices that her older sister and will look very happy. Rosetta turned to the girls and, blushing, asked them not to embarrass her. The long-awaited day of the Enlightenment ceremony has arrived. All the important people gathered in the big building. The lady in the hat, probably it was Tina, with a responsible and slightly agitated reading out a speech from a book. It's time for a briefing, a short press conference of an informative nature for freshmen. Information was recorded on the blackboard, which is important to tell the newly arrived students. After that, there was a general meeting where the incoming students exchange information they are interested in with each other. Then there is a lunch break, where you can discuss the hottest and latest news. Rosetta reports that she thinks her village has been attacked by a demon. That is why she sincerely wants to help in the hunt for his capture, but for this she needs people who will be able to help. The girl told her story. After that, she decided to say that her guardian is the god of hunting, so she is not very well versed in battles and strategies. She sadly says that her deity is not suitable for battles at all. Will decides to join the girl, because he can't leave his new friend in trouble. Rosetta is very happy and thanked her new friend with the most genuine sincerity. The boy says that if they are going to go there, then they need to assemble a team where the guys will own both magic and weapons. During this conversation, Rosa feeds Saria something delicious with a spoon. After a while, the boy and Rosetta met Tina and Artie. Will decides to introduce the girls to Rosetta. He explains that Artie and Tina are excellent swordsmen and magicians, and assumes that Rosetta has already met them in class. Tina blushed and told the boy that he was praising her a lot. Will analyzes his team of friends, a swordsman, a hunter, a magician, and a healer gathered among them. He proudly believes that they will make a pretty good team. Artie whispers to Will that they have received Zenobia's permission, so now they can safely and without obstacles leave the walls of the academy. Will thanked Artie for the good news. Rosetta is determined to move forward. Tina and Rosetta threw their hands up in the air in a confident intention to hit the road. Now they are definitely ready to get rid of the evil and terrifying demon. At that time, crows were screaming in the forest. The head of one of the wolves was away from his body. The demon is already on the trail of Will and his team. A team of friends is walking through a huge dense forest, which is located on the territory of the palace. Tina sings a funny song about the incident, and Will says that she looks pretty happy. Tina says that it's all just like a fun walk with friends. Will understands the girl and says that he is as happy as she is. Tina says that if something happens to the team, she will be able to patch up any wound, because she is a good healer. Will said that the whole team would definitely count on her. 
Will decides to check with the girl. If she can heal, then most likely that her guardian is the god of water. The girl with a smile on her face confirms the boy's guess. The girl begins to count her gods on her fingers. She lists the gods of thunder, air, fire, ice, and so on. There were only eight pillars, including the human one. Lil is clearly shocked by Tina's large number of gods. Tina explains that she has a high percentage of love, so she owns these deities. She tries to comfort the boy with the fact that there are talented people like him, who have only one deity for coolness. The guy smiles softly and asks to stop. Will clarifies from Rosetta that her guardian is the god of hunting. The girl agrees and says that she is very good with a bow, and can also recognize the tracks of absolutely any creature. In this case, they will quickly find the demon, and this is much more encouraging for the team. Rosetta points her hand to the side and asks the team to pay attention in the indicated direction. In the distance, a residential village can be seen through the trees. The girl looks at this village with a swift glance. She explains that her residents earn money by hunting and selling sheep. It is a great place to live. Will noted that the girl was right. The village really seemed like a great place. The people in this village were doing their usual daily work. Rosetta waves her hand fervently and welcomes the residents with joy. One of the guys turns around and asks in surprise, is it really Rosetta who appeared in front of them? The residents ask the girl if she returned too quickly. Some even assumed that the girl still failed the entrance exam. Rosetta reassured her friends and said that she had passed the exams and entered the academy. Immediately after this news, sincere congratulations were heard from all sides. Others say that Rosetta is the pride of their village. Will realizes that they have come to the girl's native village. The girl proudly points her palm at her new friends. She would like to introduce her village to the guys. She introduces them as Will the Magician, Artie the Swordsman, and Tina the Healer. All the guys were very pleased to meet the residents of Rosetta's native village. People around are very happy that Rosetta has real friends. The elder approached Will and shook his hand, saying that he was very pleased to meet the boy personally. Rosetta declares that they have come to destroy the demon. The people around nodded approvingly and sincerely praised the guys, saying that they were great fellows for deciding on such a bold and courageous act. The elder turns to Tina. He says that the residents turn to the guild for the adventurers to help them. The man thanks the team for coming. In response, Tina could only squeal with joy and say that she was Rosetta's friend. Will asks the elder if his team can learn more about the demon. The elder began his story. The one who first saw this beast said that it appeared in the pastures. He was herding sheep with his dog and did not even notice how the demon appeared in front of him. The shepherd, in fear, rushed to the village as fast as he could, trying to call all his sheep after him. However, the demon still managed to drag away many, and also somehow mysteriously obtained the crops of the village and spoiled the harvest. After leaving the village, the guys headed to the place where the demon was first seen. Rosetta used her search skills to find something and invited her friends to look at it. There were huge footprints of a demon bear on the ground. The tracks went in one direction, and Rosetta pointed out the direction of the creature. The girl suggested that the bear could have returned to his den, and this must be tracked down. The guys reach the clearing. It seems that they found a bear, because the tracks end at a huge cave. It is likely that the demon is inside her. Tina looked at me wonderingly and asked if the guys could use magic this time. Rosetta is surprised and asks, not without interest, how this can be done. Rosetta notices that this is what should be expected from Tina, and Will confirms this and says that there is also a place for Tina's strategy. Rosetta explains that when the demon comes out of the cave, the guys must stop him with the help of a bow, and Tina's magic. She confidently agrees and asks to leave this matter to her. Rosetta continues and says that Artie will then attack him with a sword, and Will will be there in case something goes wrong. Everyone agreed with the proposed strategy. The guys took up their fighting positions and prepared for the attack. Rosetta asked if everyone was ready, and without delay began the countdown, starting at 3. Tina began to summon her magic, and the operation began. A huge fireball descended from the sky and headed towards the cave. Will understands that, indeed, such magic is subject only to a magician with excessive love. Tina's magic power and firepower are much stronger than any other magician's. At this time, Tina hesitated a little, because it seemed to her that she had gone a little too far with the force, and she needed to make the ball a little smaller, otherwise a fire would happen. A terrible roar comes from the cave, and a demon bear jumps out with great force. The creature, jumping out of the fire, flies straight at the team of guys. Rosetta was shocked by how huge the demon bear was. At this moment, Artie instantly steps forward, taking his sword out of its scabbard in one second. The girl pulled out her sword and pointed the tip towards the demon. 
She dealt with him in just a couple of moments. Artie folded her sword carefully and said that everything was ready. Tina began to apologize and explained her behavior by saying that she was scared and confused when she saw what a huge bear. The girls on the team began to praise Artie for her ability to hold a sword with confidence. Rosetta admits that even though she has good eyesight and attentiveness, she still couldn't spot the demon. Will was extremely pleased with such brilliant results because this was to be expected from his pupil's pupil. Artie said that this bear has a huge carcass and Rosetta also noticed this. The girl approached the bear and said that Artie was right. The fur at first glance is undoubtedly thick, but in fact it is quite thin. Will thought that it wasn't a bear eating sheep at all and asked Rosetta's opinion about this alleged situation. She thought it was strange and decided to go into the cave anyway. Will informed Artie that he and Rosetta would go and inspect everything in the cave and the girls would have to deal with the bear in the meantime. Rosetta invited the remaining girls to take her sharp object into service. After a while, Rosetta and Will come out of the cave and apologize for being there for so long. Rosetta tells us that there were no bones, wool, or other objects in the cave. The cave was completely empty. It is likely that a completely different demon ate the sheep. Tina explains that in this case, they will need to find another creature before it eats someone else. There was a split carcass of a bear lying in the clearing. Will was amazed by what he saw and said that the girls coped with the task perfectly. Artie, not hiding his curiosity, asks what the guys will do with him. Will suggests a clever idea to take the bear parts to Rosetta's village. He believes that the carcass of the animal will be an excellent compensation for all the damage caused. The girls confidently supported the idea. The guys turned to Rosetta and asked if she was okay. The girl looked down and small drops of tears appeared in her eyes. She sincerely thanked her friends for the good attitude towards her and her homeland. Will offered to collect everything and take it to the village, and the residents themselves will figure out what they will do with this bear. His fur is quite large and heavy, and Rosetta decided to take only him, since the meat may be poisoned because of the demon. At this time, Fury Fury jumps out of Will's hands with fun on his muzzle. The boy could not hold the pet and it quickly galloped away from the guys. A satisfied slime deftly jumps inside the animal. The trio of guys were closely watching the actions of the monster. After that, the slime suddenly expands and completely absorbs the remains of the animal. The guys were very surprised by slime's ability. After a moment, the monster dissolved the remains of the animal inside its body. One of the travelers noticed how the meat of the animal quickly disappears into the body of the mucus. One of the girls added that after absorption, only fur and fangs remain in the slime's body. The other was surprised to see excrement inside the monster. The satisfied slime has finished the digestion process. One of the guys noticed that it looked more like a big humus, however. He was not sure that such a thing could happen in slime's body. After that, the girl in the hat started hugging the slime saying that it meets her expectations. Her friend was confused by the girl's actions. The beastman looked at the boy in surprise and asked him if slime could digest a demon like that. She added that she did not believe in this one and suggested that it was a new species. The young man awkwardly noticed that she didn't know much about his ability. The boy suggested that the guys go and inspect everything around the pasture again, so as not to miss a single clue. He added that they might have missed something. The beastman supported his proposal. After a while, the guys came to the pasture. One of the guys reminded me that the demon bear came from there. The beastman bent down to the ground and informed the companions that there were traces of sheep in this place, as well as traces of a demon, and they matched. The girl added that this means that they all came from there. The young man invited them to go further and take a look. The guys went into the forest, and on their way the beastman noticed something unusual. The girl said that there were traces of wolves on the ground and suggested that they were also demons. The young man assumed that the sheep were stolen by wolves, not a bear. The girl replied that if the wolves were a pack, then they grappled with the bear to steal the sheep. After that, she added that the tracks were still fresh, so they were going somewhere. The boy said that it was not difficult to hunt sheep, after which the beast man drew the attention of the guys to the identity of the tracks, which indicates that the sheep followed together. The young man asked if this was possible without a shepherd. The girl noticed something suspicious in the footprints. She was surprised to say that there were 11 sheep. The young man replied that this was impossible and suggested that the girl had made a mistake and she should count everything. The beastman replied that her calculations were correct and suggested that the guys continue to follow the tracks. The tracks led the guys to the cave, which is why the company assumed that the sheep had run into this cave. The girl noticed that there were no traces of wolves near the cave and was surprised to assume that the sheep themselves came here and hid from the monsters. The boy asked if this was possible and added that the sheep would not be able to come here on their own. 
Tina and Artie cheerfully said that they believed their friend's words. This pleased Rosetta, and she thanked the girls for their trust. After that, Rosette came closer to the cave and said that she would go down and look around. The girl standing at the cave noticed something unusual and looked into the depths of the shelter. Suddenly, Rosetta was thrown back by a goat that ran out of the cave. The young man managed to catch the girl. He was surprised that she could be thrown away and looked towards the cave. There was a little goat in front of the guys. The guys were very surprised by his appearance. One of the girls drew attention to the other inhabitants of the cave, which attracted the attention of the young man. There was a flock of sheep behind the goat. There were ten of them. Rosetta looked at the goat warily and protected the young man from the animal. The guy assumed that the eleventh trace belonged to this goat. The girl replied that she would never confuse the tracks of a sheep and a goat. The young man came closer to the goat and asked him if he was protecting the flock of these sheep. The goat bleated in response. This conversation surprised Rosette a lot. The young man told the goat that they had come to fight the demon bear at the request of the village, and in the end they took all the sheep, all thanks to him. He added that he wanted to take him home and thank the little defender. His companions were at a loss. The kid's name is Kiki. He said he stayed with the sheep for a week so they wouldn't get into trouble, helping them drive away the wolves. After that, they ran into a cave to hide from predators. The kid defended the herd from attacking monsters every day, so he is very proud that he did not leave and helped, but now he is very hungry. The young man's companions began to stroke the goat and praise him for his courage. The hero understood that since he understands what the goat is talking about, it means that he is not a simple animal. He is a divine beast. After that, a loud howl of a wolf was heard, it attracted the attention of the guys. When the guys heard the howl, they turned around. There was a pack of wolves in front of them, they surrounded the adventurers. Seeing the enemies, the goat rushed at the wolves, which greatly surprised the hero and he asked him to stop. The goat rammed into the wolf, and the monster flew away. The kid's lunge scared the rest of the enemies. Rosetta was surprised at how accurately the baby hit the target. The young man noticed the fear of the wolves and gave the order to attack them. Rosetta pulled the bowstring and aimed at the wolves. Tina and Artie did not stay away, and also attacked the enemies. The guys quickly dealt with the wolves. Rosetta noticed that there were as many wolves as there were tracks that they found in the thicket of the forest. The guys summed up that they had destroyed the demon bear and the wolves. The sorceress joyfully announced that they had won and mentioned the power of friendship. The young man reminded her that they had not yet taken the sheep to the village. Slime was standing behind the guys, digesting the remnants of the monsters with great difficulty. After that, the guys quickly hurried to the village. When they reached it they saw the residents, who were delighted that the sheep were safe and sound. They invited them to stay, but the guys thanked them for their hospitality and decided to leave, as Rosa and Seria were waiting for them at the academy. The guys went on and one of Will's companions thanked them for their help. The witch girl walking in front replied that she shouldn't worry, because they had a great time. Besides, they were friends with her. During his march, the young man ate cookies with an appetite, adding that the donated souvenirs of the residents are simply gorgeous. The girl watched the young man eating sweets and asked him to share the sweets with her. Will smiled and replied that they had all done a great job, so she deserved it no less than the others and handed her a cookie. Taking the sweet in her hands, she was very confused and joyfully rejoiced at the gift. The girl put the cookie in her mouth contentedly. The sorceress sat down near the tree and said that she was very tired. The young man replied that they had not rested since they left the village. He added that they could go back to rest if she wanted to. The girl gave a negative answer and said that Seria and Rosa were waiting for them, so they should return home as soon as possible. Rosetta asked Will what they would do with the kid. She added that the goat was not even afraid of wolves and suggested that he could also be a monster. The young man went up to the kid and began stroking him. He replied that he simply had nowhere else to go, so he took him with him. Will added that it was not a burden for him to take care of him. Rosetta was pleased with his words. The hero continued to gently stroke his pet. Suddenly, Will noticed something was wrong and turned around abruptly. A large fireball was approaching Will and his companions. The young man ordered Artie to call everyone here. Soon after, there was a giant explosion. Steam was coming from the magic circle of the villa. The guys took refuge behind the magic circle of the villa. The young man said that everything went very suddenly. It was good that they managed to take cover. The girl replied that the place next to him was the safest. After that, the guys were attacked by a gang of bandits in rags. Will didn't know who they were. Artie said they were cult killers. The young man supported her opinion. The mention of the cult horrified Tina. She remembered her past. Will shouted her name and brought her to her senses. The hero turned around and said with a smile that everything was fine. 
He asked the girl not to worry. The young man added that she just needed to use her magic and suggested that these were demon wolves in human form. Tina gathered her strength, she yelled at the bandits. The attackers were crowding the girls, and it was hard for Rosetta and Artie to fight them. Rosetta asked her what she should do. The young man understood that the person who created the fireball was hiding somewhere. He assumed that they were attacking with magic that man had created. Will decided that they needed to find the source of the magic. The young man did not have time to do anything because a strong wind blew on him. His squad had already attacked the raging storm wind magic. The girls beside him were confused, but the young man assured them that everything was fine and asked them to stay close. It was too bright around, so Will couldn't see anything. The boy decided to use the spell Thunderstorm Flash. With this skill he lifted his enemies into the air. All the opponents got their own spell while in the air. Will understood that this magic was too common, so it was easy to destroy it. Rosetta added that they repelled her with a single spell, destroying their enemies. After that, the girls turned their attention to the two remaining enemies. Artie was being pushed. She told the guys that they were still alive, so they needed to be on the lookout. Losing the leader, the others become confused, but these two continued to advance. The girls prepared to attack the remaining opponents. The guys were able to fight off the enemies. We'll ask Tina if she was okay. Tina gave a positive response. The girl happily declared that they had done a great job with them and she hoped that all their opponents had died. Will awkwardly remarked that murderers are very tenacious. The girl hurriedly corrected herself saying that she wanted revenge. One of the attackers grunted and stretched out his hand to Tina. The killer began to cast a spell. The killer did not have time to strike because Kiki threw him aside. Rosetta and Will looked at the fallen bandit. The young man asked if the attacker was still alive. Rosetta replied that it was unlikely. Will assumed that he died from Kiki's blow. Rosetta looked at the kid in horror and told him that he was amazing. Artie added that he wasn't moving. Suddenly, the man's body rose into the air, which greatly surprised the guys. The killer's clothes began to tear. The hero's squad did not understand what was happening to him, because the man had already died. Artie ordered everyone to stand back and began to draw her blade. Artie struck at the bandit's giant arm and her sword broke. The girl was horrified by what had happened. She said that the enemy had finally appeared. The reincarnated enemy growled. A giant devil stood in front of the guys. The demon said that he should thank them all, because he managed to be reborn only thanks to them. It seemed to all that he had already encountered him. The young man knew that he had experience fighting evil spirits in a previous life, but somehow he missed the moment when the devil is reborn after the death of the vessel. The boy rushed at the devil. Will's foot hit the monster's forehead, which made the latter laugh. The demon grabbed the hero's leg. The demon squeezed Will's leg and said he could crush him like a bug. He added that his childish curiosity played a cruel joke on him. The demon forcefully threw the hero to the ground. This outcome greatly frightened and surprised his companions. Will's companions began to attack the demon, but their level was not enough to inflict any damage to the demon. Artie's punches didn't do any damage to the monster either. As a result, the devil mockingly asked the girl if she was going to cut his head off. After this provocation, the devil suddenly lost his arm. Will, standing behind him, said that although his skin was hard, it could be cut. The young man held the severed hand of the devil in his hands. He added that his body is very weak right now. The devil held onto the rest of his arm and stared at Will in dismay. The young man added that they would finish him off now. The devil, horrified, asked the boy what he had done to him. Will replied angrily that he just found out that the devil is just as mortal as they are. His words made the demon angry. The devil went berserk with anger. He shouted at the young man not to get arrogant. The devil added in anger that he was much stronger than them and now he would destroy them. Immediately after that, the devil's head fell off his shoulders. The devil's face was in the air without losing its original grimace. Will stood behind the demon with mana concentrated in his hand. He made something like a mana blade. The headless devil fell down behind the young man. The instantaneous outcome of the battle greatly surprised Rosetta and Tina. Rosetta and Tina cheerfully praised the young man. Will awkwardly thank the girls for their kind words. Artie held the rest of her sword in her hand. She practically tearfully said that the young man had simply destroyed her as a swordsman. The young man awkwardly apologized to the swordsman. The devil grunted, which managed to attract Tina's attention. The devil's body started to dissolve pretty quickly. The young man said that it dissolves and turns into liquid, and steam comes out of the severed place. Will asked Artie if she knew what it was. The girl replied that she did not know, but it could hardly be something good. The young man tried to freeze the devil's body. It didn't help and the body continued to melt. After that, the hero decided to use the magic of thunder, fire and wind, but they all turned out to be useless. The young man used water magic. Unlike other elements, it had some effect on the demon's body. 
Because of the water, the devil's body began to shrink, and the areas where it hit the water turned black. Tina suggested that this was an indicator that everything was working. The young man exhaled and decided to proceed to the next stage of the experiments. At that time, a plate broke somewhere. It turned out that Saria's plate suddenly split, which surprised the girls who had lunch with her. One of them asked if everything was in order in Saria, and the other informed the warrior about the incident. The girl ran up to Saria and started kneading her cheeks. She said she was very sorry and asked the girl if she was hurt. Saria replied that she was fine. Saria suddenly turned to Will, which greatly surprised the boy. He remembered his past life. Wings appeared from the devil's body. After that, Tyndris hovered over the demon's body, looking at Will. In front of the hero stood a giant chimera. It was a white wolf with wings. He looked at the young man. Will asked if it could be a Tyndris. Will couldn't believe it was Tyndris. He was very doubtful about it. The beast is small in stature, and it differs in shape. Will suggested that they might be related. The wolf looked at the boy calmly. Will didn't understand why he didn't attack them. Will assumed that the wolf was afraid to approach him because he had a god of beasts, or he basically did not want to engage in battle with him. The wolf turned his attention to Rosetta. This horrified the beastman. Not long ago, he was a monster, but now he is so powerful that his strength cannot be compared with anyone. Rosetta remembered the rose and squeezed her eyes shut. Will turned to Rosetta and Tina with serious intentions. Will ordered the girl to urgently return to the academy and ask for help, while he tried to detain him. Rosetta said, confused, that it was too risky. Will replied that they were the ones in danger, and he would be fine. Tina wanted to object to the young man, but Will interrupted her and once again asked her to run away, and call for help as soon as possible. Tina remembered the last one. He was afraid that she wouldn't make it in time. Rosetta took Tina on her shoulder and told her that they should listen to Will. Her attitude confused Tina. The girls went to the academy. Tina asked the young man not to die before their arrival. The young man was holding his special ring in his hands. He could use the ring to contact Zenobia. However, he didn't know how long he could hold out while they ran for help. Will activated the ring. He turned to Zenobia. The young man said that he was the one who notified Zenobia that they were attacked by a beast and they were now fighting with it. Zenobia was surprised by his words. She did not understand what he was talking about. Will added that it seems to him that this is Tynris, the monster of catastrophes, or perhaps one of his children. Zenobia replied that they would come right away and asked the young man to wait for them, because safety is above all. Will replied that he had heard her words. Artie remembered the ring and the voice and assumed she had heard the teacher. Will replied that he would tell them everything later, but for now they would focus on the enemy. Artie echoed his words. She added that she would not let him fight alone. Will pointed his hand at the girl's broken sword and began to use magic. Will knew that she was powerless against the monster of catastrophes and an ordinary sword would not help here, so he needed to strengthen her. This greatly surprised the girl. Artie looked at her new blade with delight. Will said he made it in a hurry, but he won't let you down in a fight. Artie thanked him for the new sword. Tyndris stood in front of them. Will asked the girl if she was ready for battle and added that they should defeat him together. Artie agreed. Will prepared for battle and said that now he could not escape from them. The young man used the spell Deadly Blade, which attracted the wolf's attention. The magic was directed at the wolf, but it forked and avoided the blow. This upset Artie a little, but Will was ready to use another spell. The young man put his hand on the ground and activated the earth magic hands of the earth. The hands that emerged from the soil grabbed the wolf, which greatly surprised the monster. Immediately after that, a hail of arrows came at the wolf. It was the sharp arrow spell. The wolf was immobilized, which pleased Artie. The chimera growled and gathered its strength. After that all the arrows cracked, the hands from the ground were also destroyed. The wolf rushed at the young man. Will realized that he had destroyed all the magic with a single flap of his wings. The boy managed to use magic to block the monster's lunge. The hero added that he would not allow scratches to be left on his body. While the wolf was pushing against Will's magic circle, the kid rammed him. Kiki's blow caused significant damage to the wolf. Will praised his pet. When the young man looked at Kiki, he saw a giant goat in front of him. Kiki's transformation surprised the guys a lot. After that, Slime covered the guys with his body. Artie and Will noted how big they had become. Slime and the goat rushed at the chimera. Will's pets gave a pretty good rebuff to the monster. Their strength pleased Artie and Will. The young man said that with such strength, pets do not even need their help. The pressure of the pets angered the wolf and he roared, provoked them to attack each other. Artie rushed at the wolf. The girl screamed at the wolf not to touch her allies. The girl cut off two legs of the wolf. The monster growled in anger. Artie called him pathetic. After that, the girl was thrown back by the wolf's attack. Will ran up to the stricken Artie, and she apologized for not seeing the attack. 
will realize that the wolf had touched her with the help of a fog spell. He hoped that their magic was not cursed and she would be all right. The young man understood that the opponent was strong and insanely agile, so he needed to come up with something else, otherwise they would lose at this rate. The boy thought about using other magic. Will decided to combine the magic of water, air and earth. He directed the spell towards the wolf at its muzzle. The spell water trap deprived him of his view. The young man deliberately cast a spell on the wolf's face to deprive him of sight and hearing. The monster howled in rage. Will told the wolf that he shouldn't even try to remove this magic. Even the magic of the mist wouldn't help him. He added that his abilities are now as strong as his own. Water magic neutralizes, preventing your energy from coming out. Will realized that there was nothing else for him to do and he decided to use some special technique. Will directed the water from the spell deeper into the wolf. He said he had been waiting for this for a long time. The wolf howled and foam poured out of his mouth. With the help of air magic, the pores penetrated into the wolf's body, spreading poison. This will weaken the wolf and his body will cease to obey control. This spell will spread long and painfully, paralyzing every inch of the wolf's soul. Will asked the wolf what it felt like to swallow his power. After that, the chimera spat out many powerful projectiles towards the young man. Some of the shells hit the hero, Will said that he could not put up much protection because of the control of another force. Will held on with all his might, he needed to hold on a little longer to reach its center. After that, Artie attacked the wolf from above. She delivered a sweeping blow to the wolf's mouth. Then Kiki crashed into the wolf's chest, and Slime grabbed his paw and began to melt it in his body. Will realized that they had come to his rescue together. They needed to hold out a little longer. After a moment, Will was able to reach the center of the wolf. The young man reached the center and set out to destroy the wolf's power. Will was able to hit the wolf and it fell to the ground dead. Will didn't understand why he died. The hero said that he had reached its center, but he only wanted to destroy its power. He did not expect that it would be able to kill the beast, because its skin was quite durable. Will realized that the duel with those stupid brothers had only done him good. Will looked at his wounded ally and said that she needed to be treated urgently. Artie asked if the wolf had put a curse on her. Will sat down in front of his colleague and began to use healing magic on her. Artie awkwardly said that his magic was very strong. Artie said that this beast was insanely strong and she couldn't defeat it even with a weapon. Will remembered Zenobia telling him in tears that she had defeated a demon that had neither arms nor legs. Will exhaled contentedly and thought that Zenobia had a worthy student. The young man stroked the girl's head and said that there was nothing wrong with that. The main thing was that everything was over. He added that if she understands this, she will definitely become a strong warrior in the future. The girl listened to her partner in embarrassment. Artie felt very embarrassed by the actions of her companion. After that, Will came to his senses, the young man realized that he had remembered little Zenobia. Will hurriedly asked the girl what the condition of her sword was. The girl replied sheepishly that her sword was slightly damaged. Artie said that she controlled it easily and its metal is very strong and light, and the shape of the sword is very comfortable, so it was convenient for her to hold it in her hands. She added that the sword had a beautiful pattern and strong magical power. After that, there was an awkward pause between the guys. Artie hesitantly wanted to ask Will something. The young man smiled and said that he was giving this sword to her. Will was glad that everything was finally over. He exhaled and lay down on the grass. The young man said that he was terribly tired. Artie agreed with him. After that, the girl thanked the young man for his help. The wolf's body turned to ashes, leaving only the core. Artie asked if they were able to win just because his weak point was water magic. Will replied in the negative. Will realized that the monster was fighting on equal terms and could withstand any of his techniques. He did not have a weak spot, just something gave a slack in his body, and they were able to attack him, dealing a fatal blow. Suddenly, wings appeared behind the heroes. They were two wyverns with teams of riders. Their appearance surprised the guys. Will did not understand where they could have come from. It was Zenobia and a friend. Rosetta urged Tina on. Tina exhaled wearily and said that she couldn't keep up with her friend and asked her to take a little break. Rosetta reminded her about that monster. She added that they needed to run as far as possible to find help and help their friends. The girl furiously added that if they did not hurry up, they would be killed. The thought of it horrified Tina. Suddenly, someone addressed the girls from the sky. Because of this, Tina tearfully said that she could hear them calling their names. The girls were addressed once more, this time they looked up. After a while, the guys found themselves in the director's office. The man said he would like to hear a detailed account of what happened to them in the forests. Zenobia pointed to the director and said that she had forgotten to introduce the old man to them and added that it was her mistake. Her words hurt the director. Zenobia added that this old man's name is Edelmilt and he is one of the directors and a very strong magician. 
Edel replied with displeasure that she was older than him. Upon learning the director's name, Tina and Rosetta were horrified. Tina said it was a great honor for them to meet him. Edel laughed and said that they could do without this formality. Milt added that he had heard a lot about Tina and he and Artie had been recommended as Zenobia's best students. After that, he praised the girls. This praise greatly embarrassed Tina. Edel added that he had heard a lot about Rosetta, mentioning that Rosetta is an excellent hunter, and such people are very highly valued among them. His words confused Rosetta. Zenobia asked Rosetta and Tina to tell her what happened. We'll assume that Zenobia wanted to find out how much these two had been able to understand or find out. Rosetta mentioned a huge bear, and Tina corrected that it was a terrible wolf demon. Tina and Rosetta talked about the damage done to livestock in Rosetta's hometown, and the story of the demon, which has not yet been revealed, and the appearance of Tynebris. Zenobia asked if she had talked about Tynebris. Tina confirmed her words. Tina said that Will said his name himself when he saw this monster. This shocked the young man. Will awkwardly said that he wanted to talk about it. The mention of the powerful monster Tynebris shocked Edel and Zenobia. Will understood that in fact, the Beast of Calamity and Tynebris were not such monsters that other magicians knew about. The Beast of Calamity was killed by him and his disciples, but it seems to him that some people, such as the Seekers, know about it. The Great Master and his disciples defeated a powerful demon king who wanted to destroy humanity, and it seems that the Guardian Army skillfully manipulated this information carefully hiding it. Zenobia asked Edel what they should do next. Edel replied that she was giving orders here, so she had the floor. Zenobia tiredly said that they had no choice but to omit it and keep their trip secret, because each of them signed an oath of non-disclosure. Will couldn't remember signing such papers. Zenobia added that everything they were talking about now would not go beyond the office, as only they should know about what happened to them in the forests. Her words confused the girls. Tynris and Beast of Calamity are the names of the Demon King who was once defeated by the great master and his disciples and those bandits who attacked them at that time were his faithful followers. The rescue agency was created precisely to destroy and combat this cult, and not a single living soul knew what secrets the keepers kept. Zenobia summed up that Tina had been told everything by her teacher. Will was glad that he hadn't talked about the resurrection of the beast and his real identity. Rosetta said that she was also told about it. She asked if she was special because of it. Zenobia replied that they needed someone with Rosetta's abilities, so they went to her for help. Rosetta was very embarrassed and giggled. Zenobia noted that she looked insanely like Tina. Rosetta asked Zenobia what would happen about Artie and Will. Zenobia replied that they had found out about it in advance because they were students of their academy and had heard that they needed help. Will laughed awkwardly. Tina said that it was because of these villas that they were so prepared for battle, and Rosetta added that they didn't even tell them everything. Will didn't know what to say to them. Zenobia said that now that they had found out everything, she would like to hear from Will and Artie a detailed account from the place where the demon was killed. Artie agreed with the mentor's suggestion. The guys told them a detailed account of what happened. Zenobia said it was interesting, because they had hunted him before and had never seen anything like it. Edel and the elf sat with thoughtful faces. Edel added that there have been cases when a person becomes a demon, but for the already dead to become a demon or the original form of a demon to become a demon of a higher rank, this is the first time they see this. The director added that he would need to think about it carefully. Zenobia said that her next suggestion might seem silly. She asked the guys to stay here for a while and not go outside the building. Tina obediently agreed. Will understood that Zenobia and Edel were afraid and didn't know what to do. Although it was a high-ranking demon, only he and Artie knew its true form, the rest were caught off guard. Will doesn't believe they've gotten rid of the monster for good. Even if it happens that Tina does not inherit the throne, there is no way the Empire can lose her as the crown princess. Edel called someone and asked how he could be heard. The director hurriedly left the table and apologized for what had happened. Edel walked away from the table and started a conversation over a magical communication line. After that, he turned to the guys and addressed Will and Rosetta. He said he had an urgent task for them. Will asked the director what happened. Edel suggested that they have opponents on the horizon worse than Tynebus. This greatly surprised the guys. Will wondered why only he and Rosetta were being sent on this mission. Saria and Rosa came into the room. The girls were very pleased to see their relatives. Will and Rosetta took the babies in their arms. The teacher apologized for the fact that they could not keep them. She added that the kids were so worried that they asked to see them as soon as possible. Will apologized for the trouble his sister caused. Saria touchily asked the young man if everything was okay with him and added that she was very worried about him. Will replied that he was fine and apologized to his sister for making her worry. 
The young man added that his clothes were only slightly tattered. This scared Saria a lot. Will said amiably that he got a little carried away when he was playing with a goat and a bear cub. His words offended Saria. She isolated the fact that he was playing, not fighting. Will apologized again. The young man added that now they have a new family member, which greatly surprised the baby. Saria was delighted to see the goat. After a while, the young man returned to his room. Saria amiably stretched out her hand to the goat, which she named Beliash and asked him to give her a paw. Kiki put his hoof on the girl's forehead and bleated. This made Will laugh. Will noticed that all their animals have divine powers. He remembered about the previously tamed dog. Will knew that Saria was crazy about them, and it seemed to him that she liked the goat too. He noticed the new name of the goat Beliash. Will realized that Kiki had also settled in and no longer seemed like a dangerous animal to him. Although sometimes he continued to butt him in the leg. Someone knocked on the door and asked for permission to enter. The young man replied that Artie could come in. The girl came into the room and said that she and Will needed to hurry up. She was very surprised to see the inhabitants of the room. Artie noted the number of people in the room. Will replied that Saria thinks they have too few animals. Will added that he needed to take her to the nursery. Artie replied that she would take them to her. Will assumed that it could be Zenobia's order and asked Artie not to worry and asked her to wait here. The girl replied that she wanted it herself and no one ordered her to do anything. Will said that in that case they should hurry up and Artie looked at him uncertainly. Some time ago, Will and Edel were sitting opposite each other. The director said that Will's magic power is unstable and weak since he is in the body of a small child. Edel added that he still doesn't understand how Will managed to split the core into two halves. Will replied that he also thought it was impossible, but thanks to the help of the guys and Artie's distraction, he was able to focus and direct his power against the demon. The young man added that she saw how the power of water negatively works on the demon, blocking its actions, but the beast of disaster tried to redirect energy to it to do something. Edel replied that they had not known anything about the demon's weaknesses before, making only assumptions about it. Will asked if they could work out his actions and at least find out the approximate strength of the disaster monster. Will summed up that thanks to their squad, they managed to find out something. Edel agreed. Edel said he had one suggestion and three requests for the master. Will asked what he wanted from him. First of all, Edel asked for help in investigating the case of the disaster monster and his henchmen. Will cheerfully replied that he was not against cooperation. Edel replied that the young man could use his office whenever he wanted. He added that the necessary papers and documents are stored here, so the work will become much easier. Later he will tell him when they will start investigating. Will thanked him for the opportunity. Regarding the request, Edel said that he wanted Artie to become his teacher, as he, like her, needed constant practice. Will replied that he was not against it, because movement around the school would become much freer. Will asked if no one would suspect if he, being the best student with Divine Beasts, would train with a girl. Edel replied that in order to confirm the Divine Beasts, it is necessary to define educational guidelines. Assumptions alone will not be enough, so there is no problem in this. Edel notified the teacher that he just needs to train hard to get the necessary skills. There are many applicants who want to work with him. Will realized that it was perfectly reasonable for everyone to mistakenly perceive the measurement results as their own abilities. Edel decided to move on to the second request. He needed to find out something. Edel asked what Rosetta's abilities were as a potential hunter. Immediately after this question, Zenobia jumped onto his couch and showed interest in the question. Will replied that she was a very good hunter, and the way she found traces of wild creatures was amazing. Will added that although she doesn't have much experience in combat, she handles a bow wonderfully, and she also has a nice character. Zenobia was cheerfully listening to the boy with a cup of tea in her hands. Edel summed up that they really made a great team of four. They just balance each other well using their strength. Will agreed with his words and added that he wants to continue working with them. Edel exhaled contentedly and said that he appreciated it very much. After that, the young man asked what the director's third request was or was that all he wanted to know. Edel hesitantly replied that it was about Rosetta and her future stay here. Will asked what it was about. The principal said that he wanted Rosetta to become Regina's student. He added that Regina has no equal in weapons. She is an excellent archer and swordsman. Will replied that he understood this and asked what was wrong with it. Edel was uncertainly silent. The principal replied that Regina was not taking students. This surprised Will a little. Edel added that it would take a lot of time to tell the reason. Zenobia replied that everything was fine. Edel coughed, preparing to begin the story. This story happened 90 years ago, when she had one student. Regina loved and respected him very much, and devoted all her free time to him. 
One day, her hometown and their country were attacked by demons. While Regina was protecting the people in her homeland, he was protecting the country by acting as a human shield and not letting the demon to the gate. After some time, she returned back and defeated the demon, but it was too late as the disciple received a fatal wound. After seeing Regina defeat the demon, he died with a smile on his face. She raised a really strong student. Then, on the day of that battle, he was by his side and saw everything with his own eyes. But the demons were too strong to fight them alone. The enemies had deliberately planned everything so that Regina would be absent while they dealt with her beloved student. After that, her only words were I will never take students again. Will asked if he was sure Rosetta could be trusted with her. After this question, Will asked what the problem was. The young man said that she could be understood, she had lost her beloved student. He reminded me that Edel also knows what kind of confusion a person feels when a comrade with whom you fought side by side dies. Zenobia said they had to do something to get her back. It's been a long time since then. She added that the request was for Will to talk to her and ask her to take Rosetta as an apprentice. Then the young man understood why they had told him this story. Will understood the grief of losing a beloved student. He was once a master himself, so he understands her feelings like no one else. Will exhaled wearily and replied that he would talk to her. This pleased Edel. Will asked the director and Zenobia not to expect much from their conversation. Edel replied that the master's words would resonate in her heart. Will asked if Edel had told him everything. The director gave a positive response and thanked the young man. Will decided to return to what they had discussed before this request. The young man said that he wanted to use his room for an investigation. His words surprised Edel a lot. The director behaved very uncertainly, which displeased Zenobia. Zenobia, displeased, asked Edel if he wanted to clean his office first. The girl angrily said that the old man had so much junk that the master would not even find the papers he needed. Edel reacted emotionally to his friend's words. The man said that there were a lot of necessary things in his office that should not be thrown away. Edel and Zenobia looked at each other. Because of the girl's piercing gaze, Edel was forced to turn away. Frustrated, Will stood by the door and said he would contact them later. The young man remembered that in his previous life, he always said that everything should be organized. Will glowered at Edel and told him to clean up his office and hide away all the necessary things until his next visit. Edel apologized hesitantly. The young man left the room and noticed Artie standing not far from the door. Will asked if he had been standing here all this time. The girl replied that he shouldn't worry, because it was part of her assignment. Will and Artie were sitting opposite each other in the young man's room. Will reminded Artie that she didn't have to follow him around. The girl gave a negative answer. Artie asked if this annoyed the young man. The boy replied that this was not the case. Will and Artie looked at each other awkwardly. As soon as the young man turned to the girl, she reacted strangely. Will said he wanted to ask her something. Artie asked what was the matter. The hero asked why she was trying so desperately to get closer to him. He added that he was really interested in finding out about it. Artie said, confused, that this was not what he could have thought of. Will replied that he hadn't thought of anything like that. He was just curious. Artie confusedly said that she was very worried about Will. The hero suggested that these experiences were not accidental. He asked the girl if she knew who Tyndris was. He was sure Zenobia had definitely told her about him. He recalled that at the moment when the wolf attacked them, he was too carried away to tell anything about it. Artie awkwardly replied that she knew everything about him and this monster. Artie apologized for finding out his secret, which the young man had been keeping all this time. Will replied that she didn't need to apologize, because everything was fine. After that, the hero said that there was something else she didn't know about him. Will clarified that he was talking about his real name. Artie hesitantly asked if Will's name was his real name. The young man solemnly replied that his real name was Edelphus Worms, that was his name in a previous life. Artie hesitantly asked if he was the master. Will replied that she might not believe him, but other teachers could confirm this, as they had been his students in a previous life. Artie thoughtfully said that he believed him. The girl added that she was very surprised by this, but felt that he was an unusual person. Will noted how quickly the girl believed his words. Artie replied that reincarnation cases are very rare nowadays, but they exist and have even been confirmed. She added that it is much rarer to find cases when a person has retained a memory from his past life. Artie hesitantly said that an eight-year-old boy would not be able to defeat the strongest magicians or powerful monsters so easily. Therefore, it is logical that only a great master could manage them. Will hesitantly replied that he had won only because of her help. After that, Artie asked if his animals were divine. 
The boy replied that he just wanted to talk about it. Will added that he was made like this by a goddess. In response, Artie suggested that he was a favorite of the gods. After that, Will told Artie how he went from his death to today. Artie summed up that divine beasts, guardians, and half-breeds are all true. Will replied that ordinary animals would not be able to possess such power, so everything was obvious. The young man approached the girl and said that everything they talked about with her was their secret and no one except her, Zenobia, and other teachers knew about it. The girl replied that he shouldn't worry, because she wouldn't tell him anything. Artie asked why he decided to share all this with her. Will replied with a smile that he trusted her as he trusted himself. He surprised and slightly embarrassed the girl with his answer. Will added that even though she is one of the rescuers, he saw how she risked her life for him. Will looked at Artie seriously and said that he had one request for her. Artie was waiting to hear the youngster's request. Will said that he wanted her to fight with him against the monster of disaster. He wants, as he did a hundred years ago, a decent man standing next to him, fighting evil. Artie was extremely insecure. The girl replied that, knowing his background, it would be a great honor for her to participate in the battle with the great master. She added that she would do everything possible not to let him down. Will thanked Artie and said that he wanted her to continue treating him like a villa, not a master. Artie agreed with Will and said they would work well together. The young man asked the girl if she wanted to train with him today. Artie agreed and added that she would show him a couple of new techniques. There was a knock on the young man's door. Voices from behind the door informed them that they had something to say to the hero. Tina and Rosette entered the room. One of the girls asked if Will wanted them to join his squad. Will said that the girls had good training, as he had already seen several times, both during the entrance exams and in the forest when they rescued him. Tina replied that they train every day and constantly improve their skills. The girl asked why he was so suddenly suggesting that they unite again. Tina added that she is not very strong in battles, so she is almost useless. Rosetta said that she is also not in the physical shape she can be, and in their last mission they had to run for help, so they could not help them. Will knew that they would quickly agree to his proposal. Will turned to the girls, telling them that he wanted to do something. The hero said that he wanted to team up with them so that in the future they could defeat the disaster monster and other demons. He added that to do this, they must constantly train to improve their skills and magic. Rosetta clarified that the young man wants to gather them all to kill him together. Will confirmed her words. Will said that even if they didn't have time to get together and train together, then school would be enough to gain knowledge and improve their tactics. He added that Tina is Dion's student, so she is in good hands. Will was a little confused. It's not that he doesn't trust them, but unlike Artie, Tina and Rosetta are academy students who have no connection to the Salvation Army yet. Tina is a princess, and Rosetta has a sister. During the battle with the disaster beast, something might happen to them. Tina was uncertainly silent. She gathered her strength and said that she was not strong enough to fight. Tina added that she often gets scared and runs away, hiding in the bushes, and is simply useless in battles. She cannot forgive herself for this. The girl confidently said that this time she wants to overcome her fears and help will fight the monster. Tina said that she wants to take a chance and prove to herself that she is strong and can stand up for her friends, protecting them from the monster of disaster. Rosetta added that she thinks exactly the same as Tina, so she agrees with every word she says. The Huntress stated that she wanted to help Will and fight side by side against the demon, because if they invade their lands, innocent people may suffer, and if something happens to her sister, she will never forgive herself. The girl confidently said that for this reason she wants to become stronger and protect not only Rose, but also Will. After all, they are friends, which means they should help each other. Their enthusiasm surprised the young man. Will stood up and apologized for putting pressure on them with his requests. He added that he was pleased that they decided to help and support him. The young man stretched out his hand to the table and said that he would ask it again, even though he knew the answer. The young man asked the guys if they would team up with him to fight the beast of catastrophes. The guys all put their hands on Will's palm and gave a positive response. Will said contentedly that they could start training right now. After a while, the guys come to the shooting range. The arrow hits exactly in the center of the target. This arrow was fired by Rosetta, and Will reported hitting the target accurately. Will approached the girl and said that she moved with such ease, as if there was no magical burden. Rosetta thanked the young man for his praise and informed him that she had learned this from him. During the week of joint training, the girls practiced day after day according to Will's training method, which he came up with at the Worm's house. Magical energy is constantly circulating through the body, and during this exercise they directed in the opposite direction thus strengthening the muscles of the body and the magical channels, at the same time improving your control over magic. 
Tina came out next. She charged with magical energy at the targets and hit the center of all three targets. The girl was delighted to hit the target and asked Will if he had seen it. The young man replied positively and praised the girl. Artie decided to go next. She made a dash towards the targets and cut two targets into several small pieces. Will praised Artie, saying that she was an excellent swordsman. Will said that they were a little clumsy at first, but now they are completely used to the magical burden. Artie replied that now the burden is not felt at all. Rosetta approached the young man and said that her allies were amazing. Their movements were much better than hers. Will replied that she shouldn't belittle herself because she learns very quickly. He added that they are the disciples of the sages, so they have an advantage. Will informed Rosetta that she had nowhere to hurry. The girl doubted if this was really the case. After that, he approached Tina and told her that she was making progress in controlling magic. She had noticeably increased firepower and marksmanship. His words pleased the sorceress. Tina asked Will if she would be able to use recovery magic the same way he did if she continued in the same vein. Will gave a positive response. Artie approached the young man and asked if she could become as skilled as him in close combat. Will confidently confirmed her words. Will told the girl that she had been very good with magic before, and if she trained even harder, she would even be able to strengthen her body by controlling the flow of magic. Artie replied that she would try her best to do so. Will asked the girl if she liked her new sword. He added that the length and weight of the blade can be adjusted at will. Artie pulled the sword out of the scabbard and said that it was an excellent job. The sword seemed to be an extension of her hand. Will said that her old sword, which he borrowed to slay the demon bear, was also easy to use. Artie replied that she was pleased that she liked him. Will noticed that that sword was made hastily, and it wasn't very durable, so it quickly blunted. For this reason, he is proud of this work. It took almost three days to create it, but it turned out to be excellent. The length of the handle is designed so that it fits comfortably in the hand, both as a two-handed and as a one-handed sword. Artie replied that she immediately realized that this sword was a pearl of its kind. She added that a sword of this level should be made of rare material and asked Will where he could get it. The young man hesitantly replied that he had been able to help him kindly. Will said she wouldn't need the old sword anymore. The girl replied that she was somehow sad to part with him. She noticed that they had not been together with the sword chopping tails for long. The fact that the girl gave him a name surprised the boy. Artie asked Will if he was carrying a dagger. Will replied that she had a diamond eye and added that he was also armed. This dagger was hidden under the youth's jacket. Will said he filled his hand before making a sword for her. Before his rebirth, he was more powerful in magic than in swordsmanship. But now she is a helpless eight-year-old boy and it doesn't hurt to have a weapon with her. Will added that this dagger is very cool and suggested that Rosetta and the girls would want the same ones. He summed up that he likes being a blacksmith more than a magician. Artie assumed that the legendary sage was the master of the forge. Artie wondered what to call this sword. She was going through the options Killer of the Demon Kings and Sword of the Sage. Will realized that she was seriously naming the weapon. Rosetta said she was following Artie backwards. The girl wondered if she would ever catch up with them. Some time later, the day of classes came. A joyful Tina greeted Will. The girl ran up to Will and Rosetta and said that classes would start soon. Rosetta replied that she was also looking forward to starting her studies. Will realized that they had both read the lesson schedule through to the holes. He remembered how the girls discussed their first lessons. Tina asked the young man which class he needed to go to. She stunned Will with this question. The guy hesitantly replied that he decided to just take the exams at the end of the semester. This answer surprised the girls a lot. Artie preferred to teach at home. Rosetta thought about the fact that there are more important things than studying at the academy. She suggested that a person facing a beast of calamity must have a special talent. After a while, Will, accompanied by Kiki and Slime, arrived at the director's office. He knocked on the door and Edel let him in. Upon entering the villa, he noticed two people sitting in front of him. A girl in formal clothes asked the young man if he was Will Worms. Will confirmed her words and added that he and Regina had not seen each other for a long time. Regina jumped up from her seat and shouted at the young man not to pretend, because this is the first time she sees him. Will replied that she was still small. His answer surprised Regina. Regina told the hero to shut up. The big lizard's hand blocked her path to the villa. The lizard said that he had heard from Milt and Zenobia about his reincarnation. Will told Dion that he was just as big. The young man asked if he had grown up in these hundred years. Will remembered that a hundred years ago he was two meters tall. Dion cheerfully replied that everything changes over time. Will happily agreed with the student and added that he remembers him as the same. 
Regina shouted at Dion not to get too close to the master. Regina instantly got close to the young man and grabbed him by the collar. She said furiously that he could lead Zenobia and melt by the nose, but he wouldn't fool her. This scenario scared those present in the room. Kiki and Slime set out to attack the girl, but will stop them, saying that she was a friend. Regina angrily asked if he was going to continue impersonating the master. Will replied that he was their master. Regina told him to prove it to her. Will quickly agreed. The young man asked Regina if she remembered the promise she made to him as a child. Regina was slightly embarrassed when she heard about the promise. Will remembered how, in tears, Regina had promised him to become strong. The young man said that she had given him her word on how to take good care of her weapon. Regina asked the young man what was the point. Will replied that she was five years old at the time. After that, Will added that out of curiosity she snuck into his laboratory and, seeing the stuffed animals, was scared and burst into tears. After that, Regina hugged the young man tightly and began to cry. Will began to calm down his student. The girl said that she really missed the master. Will and Dion shook hands and the lizard said that he was very glad to see them. Will replied in kind. Will turned his attention to Dion and asked if he should tell another old story so that he would be convinced too. The lizard replied that he had no doubt from the very beginning that he was their master. Edel noticed how cleverly Dion got away with it. Dion added that it was just a hunch. Regina asked if he would tell her, now that they had finally met, what had been going on with him for the last hundred years. Will asked if she had heard his story. Zenobia replied that she hadn't told them anything because she thought they would want to hear the story firsthand. Regina hugged the master again and said she wanted to hear about how he defeated Tynebris. She asked the young man to tell her about it in more detail. Will wearily agreed and offered to sit on the sofa. This greatly pleased Regina. The girl led the young man. A few seconds later, Regina and Will were sitting on the couch together. The girl hugged the young man tightly, which embarrassed the latter. The young man asked what Regina was doing. The girl replied that he would grow up soon anyway, so she wants to cuddle their master while he is still small. Edel and Zenobia thought it was strange, but will let her go on. After that, the hero told Regina and Dion the story of what happened after his reincarnation. After listening to the story, Villa Regina said in anger that she would not forgive them for bullying the master. She set out to destroy the Pyle family. Will replied that as long as they didn't harm others, they could be ignored and she shouldn't worry about him. Regina humbly accepted the master's instructions. Dion told Regina that those with power should be restrained. Regina grumpily replied that she knew about it. Will notice that Dion still unites them all. He remembered that all his students came to him as children, and he raised Dion from an egg in general. And since he is his first student, and the eldest among the others, he always brings everyone together. Regina looked at Zenobia and Edel and cheerfully clarified that they had caused Dion a lot of trouble. Dion replied confusedly that he was just doing his best. Regina's question stunned both Dion and Edel and Zenobia. Will praised Dion, which embarrassed the student. Will noticed that Dion had been working hard in his absence and thanked the lizard. Tears welled up in Dion's eyes, and he apologized for getting emotional. Will replied that he might not take it into his head. Beliash climbed onto the sofa and began licking Dion's face. Will angrily told Kiki that he couldn't do that. The young man apologized to Dion and said that Kiki was still a kid. Dion replied that it was nothing, because Beliash is a sweet child. Edel decided to move on to their next actions. He asked Will how his meeting with Tina and the team went. Will replied that he was fine and they had already started training. And he also informed them that he intended to end the Beast of Disaster and they supported him. Edel asked if the girls had revealed the master's true identity. Will replied that he only confessed to Artie. The young man suggested that compared to Artie, Tina is not ready for this yet. They were hardly insufficiently prepared at that moment. They were just girls on a completely different level, unlike Artie, who joined the rescue squad. If they found out, he would have to leave. Dion thanked me for understanding. Edel turned to Regina, notifying her that among the students, the wards of the master, there is a huntress named Rosetta. Regina replied that she had already heard this name in conversation. She assumed that Rosetta had revealed herself during the demon hunt. Edel suggested that Regina take Rosetta as an apprentice. This question slightly surprised the girl. Regina awkwardly said that Edel had brought up the subject again. The girl added that she was not suitable for this role and Milt would be more suitable as a teacher. Edel replied that the fact was that he was already listed as a teacher of the master, at least on paper. This greatly surprised the girl. He added that she was the only one who did not take a student. His words upset the girl. Will understood that even if Milt was only a make-believe master, if he took Rosetta as a second student, it would be an additional burden on him. He noted how perceptive Regina can be. 
we'll assume that this was the atmosphere in which the Council of Sages had been held for the past hundred years. As their teacher, he was pleased to observe this. Dion agreed with Regina, which pleased the girl and discouraged Edel. Dion added that he also thinks she should take an apprentice. Regina was upset by the lizard's opinion. Will realized that this question had been raised more than once. Regina said she wasn't the one who should take on an apprentice. The girl asked the master what he thought about it. Will replied that he did not see this as a problem. Regina asked if she could have a student. Will said that he thinks Regina is very strong. The girl replied that she was still weak. Dion added that since she wasn't ready, neither were they. His words confused Regina, and she asked her friend not to speak like that. Regina asked what would happen if she brought trouble on her student again. Will replied that then they would do everything possible to prevent this from happening. Will assumed that the thought that Regina couldn't do anything then torments the girl all the time. He added that it was better for her to put her soul into another student now. Regina replied that she was not sure that she would be able to do it. She was afraid that she was still not ready for it. Will assured the girl that she would be able to do it. He added that he knew what he was talking about because he had raised her. He asked the girl to believe him. Regina released the master and stood up. She confidently said that it was time for her to take on an apprentice too. Edel was very pleased with her decision. Regina shyly pointed her finger at him and said that she would make the final decision after she met with Rosetta and saw what kind of dough she was made of. Edel replied that it was her right. After a while, the girls' lessons ended. Rosetta and Tina met in the hallway. Tina cheerfully ran up to her friend and invited her to practice together. Rosetta apologized clumsily and said she had some business to attend to. This upset Tina. Rosetta suggested that we practice tomorrow. Tina cheerfully agreed with her suggestion. Rosetta decided that if she didn't try her best, she wouldn't pull everyone down. Four guys were standing in front of the director's office. Rosetta said that she was very nervous before meeting with the director. Artie replied that one day she would get used to it. Artie knocked on the door and said that they were invited by the headmistress herself. Zenobia smiled at the guys and said that she was glad to see everyone and was glad that they had all come. Rosetta asked if the director was happy to see all of them. Zenobia said they could come in. When the guys entered the office, they were all very surprised. Regina said that they were going to destroy the monster of the disaster, for which Hiyashiko thanks them. The girl added that she was the one who held this place in the Council of Sages. Regina stood clad in armor with a large halberd at the ready. She solemnly announced that the hero Regina Idaru Gracia was here. Regina added that she was ready to accept a new rank, just to kill. After that, she asked if they had any future plans for Hiyashiko. Will tried his best not to laugh. He understood that Regina was grossly mistaken. Tina politely introduced herself, calling herself Tina de Amarud. Will noticed that, as expected from the Emperor's daughter, she greeted him according to all the rules of etiquette. Regina looked at the girl thoughtfully. She turned to Tina, calling her a student of Dion. She said she would do her best for her and asked if there would be any orders. Tina thanked Regina in confusion. Regina looked at Rosetta. She greeted the girl awkwardly but politely. Regina couldn't believe her eyes. Will could hardly contain his laughter. He knew that night Regina was bursting with laughter. The mask had a voice changer function. Will asked why Artie had such a serious expression on his face. He was the only one who was careless enough. Artie's eyes stared into the distance so as not to be visible for as long as possible. Artie was shaking with uncertainty. Regina replied that it was very rude. Regina said that in fact, Sophia recommended that Rosetta be made her student. Her words greatly confused the girl. Regina said she would be honored to teach a girl with such talent. Rosetta began to deny it. Regina lit up when she saw the girl's confused look. Rosetta, confused, began to say that this was a mistake. The girl hesitantly said that Regina was wrong, because someone like her would not be able to be Regina's student. Regina listened attentively to the girl's speech. Regina said it didn't look as bad as the teachers and students said. These words shocked Rosetta. Regina corrected herself by saying that she didn't really mind taking her in. Regina started to leave the director's office. She said she knew why the student had lost his mindset. She asked her to think about it calmly. The knight left the room, waving goodbye to the guys. Zenobia smiled and said she was pleasantly surprised by Rosetta. Her words surprised the girl. Zenobia recalled that Will had mentioned that he had some tea and sweets. She added that Beliashek and Furfru had already arrived. Rosetta asked why the headmistress recommended her. Rosetta was distraught. She asked if Rabita had decided to subjugate the monster of the disaster. Rosetta added that she is useless and everyone's power is getting bigger here. Zenobia replied that in that case she assumed that Regina's student had the best of everything. Rosetta awkwardly replied that it was possible for the hero's student. 
She added that, in addition, she has two militant deities. Zenobia replied that her power did not lie in the blessing of the deities. She asked if Will and one of the demon families had escaped from the battlefield. Rosetta hesitantly confirmed her words. Will realized that he had been put up as a witness, already making him nervous. Zenobia said that Rabita had become an excellent student. She added that real strength and talent are accepted by everyone in different ways. Zenobia said that Regina was waiting for an opportunity to make Rabita her student. Zenobia said that she would find out the details soon and in truth, even if she had no talent, she surpassed herself in the test. Will wondered if Zenobia was saying that she had made a lot of mistakes when checking. Zenobia added that in addition, she can definitely say that Reseda has no flaws. She advised the girl to take her time and think about everything first, and then decide. Reseda cheerfully agreed. Some time later, Tina said that she would be healthy if she became a student. Artie agreed with her words. Reseda replied that she was still thinking about those beautiful words. Rosetta added that if Will's talent level is there, the job probably won't help her. Tina said she didn't know what was best for her to do. Will suggested that she talk to the students. Rosetta clarified whether she had ever told Tina that she was not going to become an apprentice. Her reminder surprised the sorceress. Tina replied that it was the same with Rosetta now, she felt guilty. Tina and Artie remembered Zenobia's morning workout. The director made them run because Dion was in the organization. But that didn't stop him from preparing a workout for Zenobia. Tina asked Artie what she was doing there. Artie thought about it and replied that initially her father was under the patronage of a teacher, but when she was three years old, her father died, and at five the teacher replaced her parents. Rosetta was greatly surprised by her words. Artie added that she has been practicing a lot with swords since then. Rosetta reacted uncertainly to her words. Will realized that Artie used to love sword training, and then Zenobia's. Previously, to obtain a divine sword, one had to pay a great price. If they fight against a monster that destroys everything around them and a religious organization, when they have no weak points, they will not be able to win. Tina asked Will how it was. Will said that together with Rosetta they would fight a dangerous monster. Will surely said that it would be so. Rosetta agreed, confused. After that, the young man added that they would return today. Rosetta was greatly surprised by his words. Rosetta hesitantly asked Will if she was helpful. Will replied that she was wrong, because nothing of the kind was mentioned in that plan. Will said that the students who entered were turning around, turning around, so he thought it was better for her to ask him. He added that he and Tina are not ready to face really strong opponents yet. Rosetta admitted that she lied saying that death is not scary. She added that fear is a test for each of us. Rosetta started crying. She said she couldn't live up to their hopes. Will walked over to the tearful Rosetta and took her by the shoulders. He asked the girl to listen to him. The young man told his partner that it was important for her not to lose hope. Will looked at Rosetta and said that he thinks she has talent, but it seems to him that her true power has not fully awakened yet. Will confidently added that it was natural for Rosetta to be afraid of making mistakes. Besides, when the time came and she had to fight the family of that monster, he would tell her about it. The young man added that she is a strong person, even though she is at the beginning of her journey. The hero said that she herself could become an excellent student. After a while, the guys came to Regina. When the knight saw them, she laughed and asked Rosetta if she was ready. The girl confidently said that she was ready and asked Regina to take her exam. Regina mockingly asked Will why he would not participate in her exam, pointing out the young man's health. This made the master laugh a lot. He mentally told Regina that she could have been patient. The young man could hardly contain his laughter. Zenobia was sitting at the table. Artie was standing next to her. The girl informed the director that today she would make sure that there was always tea in her cup. The director thanked Artie. Will noticed that the headmistress was already sitting at the table. He hoped she wouldn't notice how Regina was acting. Regina decided to tell the essence of the test. She added that she would explain everything once, so they should listen carefully. The behavior of the examiner aroused suspicion from the director of the academy. Regina continued by saying that the girl's task is simple. The girl said that in the dungeon, having reached the very depth, Rosetta would need to show her skills. Rosetta was very surprised to learn the essence of the task. The girl, rushing about in confusion, decided that it would be better for her to go alone. She said that they would go to the dungeon as soon as they received permission from the teacher, and already inside this dungeon she would decide what to do. The headmistress shook her head approvingly. The difficulty for the girl was that she had not descended so low yet, so she would have to try hard. Regina looked out the window. She noticed that lessons had already begun and added that she would rest tomorrow morning. Will looked at the night dejectedly. He thought it was better for her to hurry to the dungeon. 
the young man turned to Regida. The examiner was all ears and asked the young man what was the matter. Will replied that he wanted to take custody of his younger sister until the end of the exam. Regina said they still have time. Zenobia got up from her chair and said that the children had stayed at home too long before they left. They needed to visit them. Will and Rosetta thanked the director of the academy. Zenobia added that now that they have time, they can go train. She told Tina that she would go with them, which greatly surprised and slightly upset the latter. Saria asked Will if he was busy today. My brother replied that he had things to do today, but he was not busy right now. Will calmly added that he would have to come back in two days next time. Rosetta apologized to her sister. Rosa said there was no problem with that. Saria supported her and added that they also have a big deal and asked them to stay cheerful. Will patted his sister on the head and apologized. He added that she already thinks like an adult. Saria replied that everything was fine, because she and Rosa thought that her brother would succeed. The guys said goodbye to the kids. Rosetta noticed that there was someone in the room nearby. They entered the room where Tina and Zenobia were. The director said that they had prepared something for the girl. The girl was interested. There was equipment for the dungeon on the table. Zenobia said that these tools would be needed for research. It would take her a long time to get to the right place. There would be no shops to buy what she needed, so she had to choose everything she needed. We'll hope that Tina and Rosetta would choose their equipment wisely. Soon they came to the hangar with the wyverns. The footman informed them that they could help at any time. Zenobia praised the footman. Will was surprised by the separate hangar. Zenobia said Tina would go with Rosetta and Will would go with Artie. A wyvern approached the villa. She began to caress near the young man. Will asked wyvern for permission to ride her. The boy jumped on top of the monster and held out his hand to Artie. Artie hugged the young man and smiled. Will asked why she did it. In response, the girl said that he shouldn't worry about it. Artie said that the director used to ride her on a horse. Will replied that he would not be able to forget it, because he had already presented this picture. The guys started off, which surprised Artie. The party set off on horseback on wyverns.